Good morning, Good morning everyone. everyone. We warmly welcome you to the recording in progress of this year's webinar entitled A Decade of Success Ahead. Let us all rise for the national anthem. I am Sophia Francesca Lu, and together with me is Dr. Jinky Leilani Lu, and we are your Masters of Ceremony for today. Thank you, Sophia. Sophia Francesca Lu, my co-host for today, is a lecturer at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is also a PhD candidate at the CARSQ, Queensland University of Technology, Australia. She is a co-proponent of this study on road safety. Today, our fourth webinar will focus on answering the question, how can we take effective and appropriate actions toward road safety to prevent and reduce road crashes? That's a great question. And we have our fourth webinar, Evidence-Based Research and Programs in Road Safety, to guide us in taking the right action. To begin the program, may we call on Dr. Jean Kiwe Lani Lu to introduce the Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Eva Maria C. Cuchonco de la Paz is the Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. She is a clinical professor and head of the Division of Clinical and Metabolic Genetics at the Philippine General Hospital. She also served as the Vice Chancellor for Research of UP Manila from 2014 to 2018. She is a recipient of many awards, one of which is the 10 Outstanding Young Men Award for the field of genetic medicine, Dr. Eva Maria Cuchonco de la Paz. Good morning, and welcome to this series of webinars organized by the University of the Philippines, Manila, National Institutes of Health, and the Department of Health. The WHO has launched its Decade of Action for Road Safety 2021 to 2030, and its global plan emphasized the importance of a holistic and data-driven approach to road safety. Coupled with the research efforts of the team of Dr. Ted Herbosa and Dr. Jean Kilu, I'm confident that road safety will gain ground as a bigger priority for our policymakers as well as policy implementers. As the National Health Research Center, we at the UPNIH believe that road safety is a health issue. In this slide, NIH will explore the possibility of putting up a study group and perhaps eventually an institute of road safety, injury, and post-crash response. This will provide evidence-based and data-driven research towards safer roads for all. We also hope to be able to draft a joint memo circular for the consideration of all concerned agencies, the DOTR, LTO, the PWH, PNP, MMDA, with the lead agency being the Department of Health on road safety pillar programs covering road safety management and policies, safer roads and transport, safer, safer vehicles and mobility, safer behavior of, of road users, and post-crash response, as well as specific concerns like bicycle lanes, 
motorcycle lanes, child restraints, not only uh, in private vehicles, but also public utility vehicles. Amidst this global health crisis, it is time that we focus our energies on preventing the preventable. The pandemic has forced us to look towards active mobility and transport alternatives. We witness the transformation of the once bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic into more dynamic and physical forms of movement from bikes, scooters, and even carpooling. I hope that the gains of this study would encourage our policymakers to prioritize and institutionalize more sustainable forms of transport. With this, I congratulate our colleagues from the UP Manila, Dr. Ted Herbosa and Dr. Jean Kilu, their project team, as well as their collaborators who made this research possible. To all the attendees, I hope you join us towards safer, and healthier roads for all. Maraming salamat po at magandang araw sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Dr. Eva. We also have the Secretary of Health to give his welcome remarks. Honorable Francisco Duque III is a Filipino physician serving as the Secretary of Health since 2017 and previously from 2005 to 2009. He also served as the chairman of the Civil Service Commission from 2010 to 2015. Good morning to our distinguished guests, partners, and to everyone joining us in this webinar. The changing circumstances as to how Filipinos move and go about their everyday lives have underscored the importance of ensuring road safety for all. According to our online National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, or ONICE, uh, transport and vehicular crashes remain to be the top cause of reported injuries. The onset of the pandemic has only further emphasized the need to improve the safety and accessibility of our road networks. There are many ways we can improve road safety that go beyond the obvious reduction of preventable and related injuries and deaths. We must explore the option of making our roads more equitable and improving pedestrian access to the streets for almost 90% of Filipinos who do not have access to cars. In light of this, your Department of Health recognizes the urgency in developing policies that draw on the principles of inclusivity towards building healthy communities. While the DOH continues to expand its efforts in health promotion and preventive care, we also recognize that the path to road safety will involve working with various stakeholders from our national government agencies, civil society organizations, and the private sector. We have to ensure equitable access to our roads, but to also ensure that people share the road safely. We are fully aware that improving road safety will entail a comprehensive reform in plans, policies, and the infrastructure. However, as we continue to work on such reforms, we should remind ourselves that the duty of improving road safety is a responsibility shared by everyone, especially by the users who traverse the road networks daily. So let us all work together to achieve better health outcomes for every Filipino and ensure health-promoting and equitable developments in the country. Together, we can secure the safety of the Filipino people no matter where they go and how they get there. Maraming salamat po. We also have a message from the Director of the Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau of the Department of Health, who served as the Chief of Health Planning Division for over five years. Director Frances Rose L. Goma Maril obtained her bachelor's and master's degree in public health from the University of the Philippines College of Public Health. She was a Hubert H. Humphrey Fellow and studied public health policy and management 
at Tulane University School of Public Health, Director Francis Mamaril. Good morning to each and everyone. First of all, let me express my deepest gratitude for inviting me to welcome you all to this momentous undertaking. On behalf of the Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau and the Advancing Health Through Evidence-Assisted Decisions with Health Policy and Systems Research Project Team, we congratulate the project team for organizing this series of webinars on road safety and of course to our participants who are very keen to learn more about this topic despite the circumstances that we are all in the current moment. We hope that you're all safe in your respective locations. Road traffic injuries and fatalities, as most of you have already know, is recognized as one of the most important public health issues worldwide that requires concerted actions from multiple sectors for a more effective and sustainable prevention. In our local context, road injury is identified as one of the leading causes of premature deaths and accidents from 20, 2005 to 2010. Based on literature, a crucial contributor to this concern is the low level of awareness on the importance of road safety and relevant procedures around it. With this series of webinars, I'm confident that we'll be able to reach out and contribute to the increasing awareness of the public on road safety. This kind of learning opportunity is indeed crucial, not only to us from the health sector, but for all the sectors represented here that influence policies and approaches relative to road safety. I will not hold you any longer, and I am sure that each one of us is excited to learn more about road safety. Again, my sincerest thanks to the organizers and to the project team for imbibing the true essence of conducting research that is from inception all the way to its ultimate goal of research dissemination and translation. With that, I am turning you over to the organizers. Maraming salamat at magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Thank you, Director Mamaria. Today, we will take a closer look at the country's evidence-based research and programs in road safety and also be informed on how we can translate the project results of the health burden of road crash in the Philippines under Dr. Teodoro Herbosa and Dr. Jinky Leilani Lu to concrete actions, especially in creating a national policy on road safety. To introduce our webinar series, we have the overall program leader, Dr. Teodoro Ted J. Herbosa, who was the under Health Undersecretary of the Philippines from 2010 to 2015. One of his important accomplishments during his term was helping achieve universal health coverage. He also started the fellowship program for trauma surgery and the residency program in emergency medicine in the University of the Philippines. Consequently, he created the Center for Research in Emergency Medicine in Malaysia at the University Kebangsaan, Malaysia. He was also at the forefront of the World Health Organization's Safe Surgery, Save Lives Task Force that developed the WHO Safe Surgery Checklist. He was the Executive Vice President of the University of the Philippines System from 2017 to 2021. He expanded knowledge on the University of uh, of the University on the Road Safety Emerging Interdisciplinary Research and created the UP COVID-19 Pandemic Response Team. He is currently a Special Advisor to the Philippines National Task Force Against COVID-19. He is also a professor at the College of Medicine, UP Manila. Good morning, everyone. Wow, it has been quite some time. We have been together for the past three webinars and now, we are almost done. We are on our last webinar on evidence-based researches and programs. In webinar one, we had 1,305 registrants. In webinar two, we had a total of 2,177 registrants. And in webinar three, a total of 2,219 registrants. Today, we have at the very least 1,980 registrants. It has been an engaging interaction with you, though 
we just meet via Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube. So virtual, yet so real. So far, yet so clear. So short of a webinar series, yet so deep. I believe in our connectedness on road safety. We all hope that these webinar series of ours have given you a more comprehensive understanding of road safety, our road user needs, our road status index, and how a whole of society approach is needed. Our national and local governments, our engineers, police, MMDA, and LTO personnel, our hospitals and doctors, even our barangays, and you are part of and should be part of. In our first webinar, we talked about road safety management and policy directions. We heard from the World Health Organization, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Public Works and Highways, the Philippine National Police, and we heard the results of our program on the health burden of road crash injuries in the Philippines under the Department of Health and the National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. In our second webinar, we heard again from our government agencies, DPWH, MMDA, land transportation offices in Cebu and Davao, the Highway Patrol Group, as well as from the LTFRB. We talked about how road conditions, road mobility and traffic and road safety behaviors should be improved and be at par with international targets in order to drastically reduce road crashes. In our third webinar, we heard from our esteemed medical chief officers and trauma surgeons how complex emergencies from road crashes that a hospital care system is costly and must be coordinated and be able to deliver post-trauma services. Also, emergency response at the site of injury and immediate transport of victims to health facilities are vital in preventing deaths. Today, we will talk about evidence-based researches and programs. We will hear from the academe, research and policy organizations, hospital administrators, and local government units about policies and programs on road safety as a culmination of our webinar series. Through the Department of Health and the National Institutes of Health of UP Manila, it is our intent and desire to cascade this road safety program to various government agencies and government units, as well as to you, the stakeholders and the public, in order to ensure that we are all working together harmoniously to achieve our goals. We want to bring road safety closer to the Filipino people, now more than ever, and we are certain that ahead road safety webinars have been a great platform to make this possible. Thank you, Dr. Herbosa. We encourage everyone to see the link and scan the QR code on the screen for your questions. Stay with us throughout the webinar as we will be sharing the evaluation form link later and the link will be available today until 11.59 p.m. As of today, we are indeed very delighted to announce that we have a total of 2,017 registrants all over the country. Nagagalak kami na nakikiisa kayo sa ating usapin ukol sa road safety. Road safety is everyone's responsibility and should be everybody's priority. The Philippines is an archipelago consisting of about 7,100 islands with a complicated transport system, which prevent, pre presents to be a national challenge. Our first speaker is the director of the UP National Center for Transportation Studies, which is dedicated in promoting and developing the transport sector of the country through research and learning. Dr. Ricardo G. Sigua is a professor at the UP College of Engineering and also served as a director of the Institute of Civil Engineering from 2014 to 2017. He also authored a book entitled Fundamentals of Traffic Engineering, which has been widely used as main reference for textbook 
by many universities in the Philippines and was awarded by UP as one of its um, centennial publications in science in 2008. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ted Erbosa and uh, Dr. G.K. Lu for inviting me uh, to speak uh, on road safety on the occasion of this um, a Success Ahead uh, Road Safety Webinar. So the topic given to me is uh, road safety, focusing on technical and engineering aspects. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, as uh, you are all aware, um, uh, improving road safety uh, would require an integrated approach that considers the road, the vehicle, uh, the driver or the road user in general. And um, as we see here, um, uh, the, the three system, uh, the three components are drawn in, uh, uh, if you recognize it, uh, equilateral triangle, no? meaning that uh, we have to, lake, uh, to take a balanced look uh, on the, uh, these components. On the other hand, uh, improving road safety uh, would require an integrated approach that considers engineering, education, and enforcement uh, solutions. As uh, I think uh, could have been discussed earlier, that the, this road uh, traffic system is part of the safe systems approach where we look at uh, safe roads, safe vehicles, and safe uh, road users. Um, I believe that... Uh, uh, looking at the uh, resource speakers uh, who, who may be, uh, well, uh, after me, uh, they'll be able to talk on uh, enforcement and as well as education. Uh, we have uh, speakers from MMDA as well as LTO and uh, also as part of education or uh, some uh, road safety campaign, uh, I believe somebody will uh, speak about the uh, uh, road safety program for uh, children. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Um, uh, as part of uh, the technical and engineering aspect, um, I may just uh, lump this up uh, in road safety engineering. And uh, within this uh, topic, uh, we have two major approaches uh, towards improving road safety. Huh? Um, on the left side, uh, we see there uh, um, the, we call it reactive uh, approach, huh? wherein we look at uh, existing uh, historical data. And uh, what we do is uh, uh, identify uh, which of those uh, locations uh, are hazardous or not. No? Hence, uh, well, the term used is block spot. Uh, and uh, the process is uh, block spot identification. No? Uh, of course, uh, an area for research here is uh, on the definition of what block spot is. And uh, uh, as part of a team, we were able to update uh, the definition of block spot. No? Um, uh, there is a current uh, accident uh, block spot uh, manual. Sorry to uh, use the word accident, but uh, that's the actually the the uh, uh, say uh, uh, well the the name of the manual or how uh, the manual is called accident block spot manual by the DPWH. And currently, we are updating this uh, so that because it was prepared way back in 2004, and uh, we believe there is a need to update the definition. Uh, the proposed definition now is uh, uh, four road crosses every year for uh, a kilometer of road uh, for the last or over the last two or three years. No? So with this as a basis, we'll be able to identify uh, existing locations based on 
road crash uh, history. And uh, uh, well, uh, Secretary Duque has uh, uh, mentioned about this, um, this towards uh, road crash uh, reduction. On the right-hand side, uh, we see um, the proactive approach, uh, wherein uh, we call it uh, audit no? or uh, checking of uh, uh, the road uh, characteristics and uh, term use is road safety audit. Uh, here, we are looking at uh, um, new road projects and existing roads. And the uh, road safety audit is best uh, utilized, most especially uh, before the road is uh, uh, being constructed. And, um, well, the process here is uh, road crash uh, prevention. So here we believe that uh, road crash, it's not an accident, but uh, uh, they can actually be prevented. And uh, any uh, road safety program uh, is needed to achieve uh, uh, both reduction as well as prevention. Next slide, please. So in the road crash reduction, uh, essentially uh, based on uh, clustering, uh, based on maps of uh, road crashes, um, uh, we could uh, identify uh, black spots and uh, do careful uh, microscopic analysis on what really happened and uh, after that, and be able to identify appropriate uh, measures such as channelization or um, redesigning the intersection with a roundabout. Next slide, please. Um, roundabouts, uh, well, I'm a, uh, shall I say, ad advocate of roundabouts uh, rather than uh, uh, traffic signals or other forms of uh, um, geometric improvements because uh, um, roundabouts have been um, uh, tested to be very uh, uh, safe uh, since uh, speed can be very well regulated. So roundabouts can prevent serious road crashes. Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, as far as uh, road crash prevention is concerned, yes, uh, road safety audit uh, is a formal systematic road safety assessment or checking of a road or a road scheme. And uh, as I've said, it uh, has a greatest potential uh, when applied to a road uh, or traffic design before it is built. Also, even during the uh, design process, we have to look at uh, the characteristics or elements of the road design. And the RSA approach is hinged on the principle that uh, prevention is better than cure. And um, yes, we look at road design and uh, carefully uh, looking at the different elements of the uh, proposed or even existing roads, uh, we'll be able to identify you know, potential hazards uh, resulting from adverse combination of design elements. Uh, design elements, uh, uh, we're looking at both uh, the vertical and horizontal alignments of the road, and we also look at the implications uh, arising from drainage choice, uh, traffic uh, signing, and other traffic control device uh, applications. Next slide, please. Um, uh, in this table, I'll, uh, I'm presenting well-tested uh, strategies on, uh, in particular, improving uh, pedestrian safety. So we have to identify really what the objectives are. And um, yes, uh, we can have uh, four. Um, one is uh, reduction of pedestrian exposure to vehicular traffic. The second is improving uh, sight distance and or visibility between motor vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, third is um, on reduction of vehicle speed. No? So uh, again, this is one of the uh, um, aspects of the safe uh, systems approach on uh, how to uh, limit speed. And uh, the fourth is uh, improving pedestrian and motorist 
safety awareness and behavior. So within each objective, uh, we can identify uh, strategies. No? Uh, and uh, this could be a compendium or a list of uh, what we could do to address or to meet the specific objectives. So um, <clears throat> uh, it based on um, the situation, uh, based on uh, what we uh, uh, say, uh, analyze, then we'll be able to identify which appropriate strategy is uh, applicable. So you can just uh, go through this and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, say uh, apply you know? and uh, if our uh, say vulnerable road user is a pedestrian on the other hand uh, next slide please uh, for motorcycles now so we this is uh, another uh, uh, vulnerable road user uh, nowadays because of the yes uh, surge in the increase of uh, uh, mot number of motorcycle users uh, in the country. And uh, yes, we can set uh, almost the same uh, objectives. Um, uh, yeah, uh, here I've uh, given uh, four objectives, uh, reducing motorcyclists mixing with vehicle traffic. And this almost uh, very similar to the wordings uh, for pedestrian uh, safety. Improving visibility, uh, reduction in vehicle speed, uh, and uh, improving uh, safety awareness and behavior. Huh? So um, hopefully you'll be able to identify which appropriate strategy will be applicable uh, to our uh, cities or to our local government units. Huh? Uh, again, I'm stressing here, uh, Speed. Now, speed is really a very uh, one of the risk factors that uh, we have to address, and uh, the uh, even the UN has identified this as uh, uh, in its um, uh, uh, road safety week uh, last month, no? uh, focusing on uh, speed of say thirty kph. Next slide. Uh, I have a very. I have only about two minutes. Uh, so um, um, it's good to have a uh, a framework no? and uh, in order to save uh, save people's lives. And uh, I'm proposing uh, this kind of mitigation framework. And again, this can uh, best uh, apply to any specific. Uh, uh, road user or vulnerable road user. So the framework, uh, just look at uh, three aspects, but if we could avoid, no? and uh, these are uh, uh, identifying ways uh, to reduce the negative effects at the early stages. No? Uh, if we cannot do this, then uh, we go to the uh, next, uh, which is... Um, Manage no? so this would include most non-physical changes to traffic operations on, uh, on regulations, for instance, uh, enforcement. However, yes, if we could not could not uh, manage or uh, we could not uh, uh, make use of the first. Uh, uh, with mitigation measure, which is avoid, then that's the time that we uh, look at mitigation measure. No? So if effects cannot be, be entirely avoided or managed, then civil works may be required to mitigate the said, said effects. So only at that time that we do changes no? in the, um, uh, 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 say, for infrastructure, uh, but as much as possible, we look at the first two uh, first, you know, uh, based on the size of uh, the area no? occupied by avoid and manage in the triangle. Uh, we see that we could have uh, um, more benefits. Next slide, please. And I think this is the last. Uh, so again, uh, using the same uh, framework, we can apply this for motorcyclists. And even I think for other uh, uh, road users like uh, 
cyclists or those who are using bicycles. No? So avoid, manage. If, not, if they cannot be done, then we mitigate. Uh, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah. I have uh, thank you, Dr. Five, five seconds left. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Sigua. That was a very insightful talk on the engineering aspect, not only of road design, but also the design of the interface between road user and infrastructure. The transport sector of the country needs attention. We must continue to improve our transport system through investments in road design and road safety audit. Our next speaker is a consultant, project leader and manager, and a researcher for various projects of DOH, PCHRD, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization. Dr. Lester Samral A. Araneta obtained his medical degree from the UP College of Medicine and Masters in Health Planning, Planning and Financing from the London School of Economics and Political Science and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine through the Joint Japan World Bank Graduate Scholarship Program. He is an instructor in the University of the Philippines Open University, the president of the Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians and the founding president and partner of the Alliance for Improving Health Outcomes. Dr. Leroy Sam, Dr. Lester Sam Heroy. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, congratulations to the uh, to Sir Ted, uh, to Dr. Jin Key, and to the organizing team for uh, having this event, for having this webinar series. Um, it's it's probably one of the earliest and one of the first uh, of this kind where we try to um, gather all the updates and the policies um, and what has been going on for road safety. So kudos to your group. Uh, and also thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm focusing on children, uh, the road safety program. And uh, just to let everybody know that uh, this presentation is actually um, a product of a study that Physicians for Peace uh, did with, uh, so through, with DOH through the support of UDSF. Next slide. Okay, so um, basically some of the questions that we want to tackle and uh, focus on this 15 minute uh, presentation is how big is the problem? Why focus in children? Uh, what, what are some of the policies? Uh, who is in charge? and uh, what are the health programs and efforts at the national and how is implementation in localities? And of course, challenges, recommendations and what we need to do next. So uh, I'm actually very happy to see that the entire program for today and also for the previous webinars have, have discussed a lot actually on, on these questions. And uh, I'm excited to see the, the synthesis uh, of the organizing group uh, on, on this. So this study was done in 2018. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, it's uh, coming from a paper, uh, Road Traffic Injury Prevention Among Children. And uh, we had a team here, uh, but it was, it was supported by, um, by, by UNICEF uh, and impl implemented with PFP and DOH. So aside from that, uh, that we have no conflict of interest. Next slide. So I think uh, I, I'm not going to, to discuss the details here, but we know how, how problematic uh, this is, especially in children. And uh, our, our, our estimates in the Philippines have shown that nine out of 12 children actually suffer or, or get injuries from, from road crashes. And uh, we have even you know, more updated results from, from, the, the, from this webinar series. And uh, cases has been rising. We have the data on the right. It, it came from the DOH ONACE or Online uh, Surveillance System for Injuries. And um, uh, it, it is problematic that I think most of us within our families, within communities, within our streets would have um, stories on, on children getting injured in roads. So it's, it's, we, we know how big the problem is. Next slide, next slide, please. 
and uh, also the economic losses that are that are uh, resulted from this. Uh, apart from that, the the delays in growth um, and the psychological trauma for the child and for the family, and uh, the situation can get worse. No, uh, and we know that um, we have. Uh, most of the, the children who get injuries are actually boys or the males. And uh, we also have uh, an estimated loss of 2.6%. So that's around 8.6 billion uh, US dollars annual losses in the Philippines only um, because of this. Um, so there's a lot of data actually on, on uh, how big is the problem. It's just that we need to constantly improve it and update it and also share it with everyone and communicate it. Next slide, please. So the problem is there, but why focus in children? Um, this is, you know, pediatrics uh, perspectives. And uh, yeah, basically first we know that uh, children are smaller physically. So, uh, um, People in the street, drivers will, may not see them easily and they, they run and uh, um, they also have cognitive immaturity. So it's difficult for children to judge, for example, the speed of vehicles, uh, unlike adults. And there are also many other reasons aside from physical and cognitive immaturity. We have risk seeking, peer influence, uh, children, you know, just playing. Um, the roles and responsibilities of parents and caregivers to take care of children. Um, we just heard a lecture also on road, road safety, road engineering. So our roads are basically not safe. And we have uh, vehicles um, as, as a risk as well. So there are many reasons why focusing children. Next slide. Um, so this, uh, this study, uh, how we did it, actually it was uh, around eight, 10 months study where we try to review whatever data we can find and uh, also collect the data across the country uh, from a few places in Luzon besides in Mindanao and also with uh, government agencies. And uh, after two months of data collection, we synthesized and then we presented the data through a national consultation. So it was done in, in 2018 and closed and we provided recommendations to DOH in 2019. Next slide. So this project was actually part of a bigger uh, project, which is to review policy and advocacy for child injury prevention. And uh, although the, the, the talk now is on road traffic injuries, uh, we also covered the other four because there are five most common child injuries um, that we know. So we have burns, drownings, falls, poisoning. And uh, the recommendations were provided to DOH for, for better programming policy and advocacy. So uh, it was uh, supported by UNICEF. Next slide. So what are the policies? That's, that's my first question. And here I'm flashing a few RAs, uh, but I think today and also in the previous webinars, you have heard actually presentation from, from LTO, from MMDA, from DPWH and so on. So we have actually many of these Republic Acts and we are amazed with the, with the knowledge, uh, the, the, the engineering and the scientific knowledge we have even from the health sector on, on road safety. Next slide. Uh, so those are the policies. And in terms of who is in charge of road safety, we have also many government agencies, uh, aside from DOH, no? uh, who, are, who are actually in charge. And the challenge here actually is for, for the Department of Health, from, from the health and the injury prevention pro, uh, perspective, to actually gather them all and allow them to talk together, share experiences, share data, have a harmonized uh, monitoring system, um, indicators, and, and, and joint planning. So this is, this is problematic. And although it's nice to know that you know, there are many people involved, but having harmonized um, strategies and efforts uh, actually take a lot of coordination, resources, and energy. So this is important. Next slide. So that's in terms of who is in charge. Um, and I think today, and maybe after, after my part, we will hear also a lot of national level programs and efforts. And I think also in the first two webinars, 
we heard a lot of of programs, uh, including uh, safe systems approach, um, uh, many other programs and efforts. Uh, in addition to to the road safety um, action plan, we also have the 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 data national the the, the DOH ONACE, the online national um, surveillance uh, for injuries. Next slide. And uh, many of our efforts actually in the, in the Philippines, especially from health perspective, are also based on WHO recommendations. So this is a WHO campaign, Save Lives, which includes many of the things that have been mentioned already, like infrastructure, um, road safety, leadership, um, health care, um, traffic laws, uh, vehicle safety, speed management, and so on. So, so it's actually a lot, and we have we have many many programs and advocacies also promoting these. Next, next slide. But what is really the the status of implementation in our localities? So we we went around the country um, in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and tried to conduct uh, interviews, collected data from different offices, not only from health but including police, including the ALG, LGUs, and so on. We have learned uh, many things, uh, like, for example, many LGUs actually have started doing ordinances on, on road safety. And the most effective ones are LGUs with the Road Safety Task Force. Now, it's an interagency group that monitors, that implements, um, and that has its own white chat. And they're the ones in charge of, of helmet use, seat belt use, reckless driving and so on. In fact, many of these groups, uh, of these um, uh, road safety task forces have, as part of their ordinances, have ensured that there are local funds uh, to ensure road safety, engineering, medical services. They also uh, organized uh, assistance in pedestrian lanes in schools. And I think we can see Barangay Tanod's traffic enforcers doing that. There's only one road safety park, I think, in, in Metro Manila. It's near Manila Zoo, uh, but there are none other. So these, these are some of the, the implementation in localities. But really what we have found here is that information is fragmented. Um, there are no harmonized uh, indicators. And it's actually sharing actually between, between uh, different government agencies uh, is, is difficult, unless, of course, there is a task force or an interagency group. Next slide. So one of the, one of the best practices of Region 6, uh, based in Iloilo, is actually they have a regional violence and injury prevention program network uh, that includes several memberships. So they are the, it's, it's a group of you know, government agencies that meet, I think, quarterly. Uh, along with NGOs, schools, to share information, share updates, share uh, best practices, policy, and so on. Uh, this is an important group, and I think so far, from, from what we have gathered back in 2018, it's only probably Region 6 among the, among the regions that have, that have started to do this and have done well. And, and we look forward, actually, that these types of networks will be done also in other regions so that we can transfer a lot of technical knowledge, um, experiences, best practices from, from, from research into actual implementation. Next slide. So what are the challenges and recommendations? Uh, so I, I have shown you that although there is actually a lot of policies, good knowledge that we have at the national level and through coming from research, it, we need to really translate it down for implementation. And for that, we need a lot of political will. But we also need the support of you know, advocacy groups. We need data. We need a good information system. People who will do research especially implementation research and how things are being implemented. We need, we need sharing of data at the local level. Um, and uh, while, while there is a lot of knowledge already, it's really translating to the local and making sure that they have, that they have budget. So interagency task force in local governments, uh, interagency groups or networks at regional level uh, will be very, very useful actually. Next slide. Uh, and this, uh, these, these, are, these are some potential sources of funds. No? So we have national agencies providing funds, uh, but um, also we have 
LGUs that have started uh, putting in funds um, coming from coming from penalties, coming from tourism, environment, and so on. So there's potential, but this the sources of funds is really important. And considering that we have a lot of losses coming from, from injuries in children, um, and funds are also needed to, to, to mobilize. So um, there was a talk earlier on, on advocacy, on implementation and research, but really NGOs and advocates should also focus a lot um, on local uh, policymakers, LGUs, and enable them to mobilize funds. Next slide. Uh, and yeah, the top recommendations. Uh, uh, so uh, uptake in local governments is low, fragmented, and actually difficult to measure, which is why we need um, more research, uh, especially implementation research, health policy research, um, targeted advocacy to LGUs, focusing on local policies, funding, and uh, improving data, and having road safety task forces, along with, of course, infrastructure, governance, and so on. Next slide, please. So this slide actually just repeats the main messages I have, which is uh, research, especially on the implementation side and health policy, and uh, regional advocacy, the role of regional networks and advocates, sharing of experiences, safer roads, of course, the role of LGU, and the importance of having earmarked funds at the national and even local levels. So this is my last slide actually, which shows what we need to do. Um, you can move to the next slides, but really, uh, next slide. Thank you very much and, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Heroy. Assistant Regional Director Pamela Hervasho obtained her political science and master's degree in business administration and finished her doctorate in management. She served for at least 19 years in public service and is currently the Assistant Regional Director of the LTO National Capital Region East. She spearheads road safety and basic education curriculum in partnership with the Department of Education. Please welcome Assistant Regional D Director Pamela Hervasho. Magandang araw. Maaari po natin sabihin na hindi pa tayo ganoong kalapit sa lubos na tagumpay pagdating sa usapin ng ligtas na daan at lansangan. Ayon sa record ng MMDA, sa inilabas na taunang pag-ulat sa Metro Manila Accident Reporting and Analysis System o MRAS, mayroong mahigit na 116,000 noong 2018 na reported incident kung saan ito ay tumaas ng 6.25% kumpara sa noong 2017 na mahigit na 110,000. Sa ulat naman noong 2019 ay mahigit 121,000 na bilang ng mga aksidente sa daan, which is representing 4.16% increase of a reported road incidents compared naman sa 2018. Ang buong bilang pa sa taong 2020 ay mahigit 65,000. Di hamak na mas mababa kumpara sa mga unang na record ngunit maaari natin na sabihin na ito ay epekto ng pandemya kung saan nagkaroon tayo ng mga lockdown o mga community quarantine kung saan may mga itinakdang paghihigpit sa transportasyon hindi lang sa Metro Manila kundi sa buong bansa. Sa pagtaas ng bilang ng aksidente sa daan, sa kabila ng mga batas na pinatutupad, mga regulasyon ng iba't ibang lokalidad o ng isang espesipikong lokasyon, kailangan pa natin na mas paintingin ang mga programa kaugnay sa road safety sa bansa. Tungo sa mas ligtas na daan para sa lahat ng mamamayan at sa ligtas ng mga sasakyan, pampubliko man o privado, Naniniwala ang Land Transportation Office na para makabit natin ang mga mithiin na ito tungo sa mas maayos na transportasyon, ay dapat isaalang-alang natin una ang mga basic guidelines na mayroon tayo. Katulad halimbawa ng five pillars ng road safety. Una, 
Una sa qualified drivers. Dapat maiging nasusuri ang isang aplikante ng lisensya para sa pagmamaneho o driver's license. Dapat lahat ay dumaan sa wastong proseso sa pagkakaroon ng lisensya. Numero uno, driver's license. Huwag kakalimutan, pabigat ang multa pag nahuli ka nagdadrive ng walang lisensya. Remember, having a license is a privilege, not a right. So always keep it with you. Para sa bagong driver na katulad ko, I always keep it with me. Remember, iba-iba ang lisensya sa iba't ibang sasakyan. May process para makakuha ng lisensya para sa bawat isa. Sa LTO po, ipinatutupad namin ngayon ang theoretical driving course para sa mga nag apply ng student permit at practical driving course naman sa nag apply ng grand professional driver's license. Naglalayo ng regulasyong ito na itaas ang kalidad ng ating mga drivers para sa pagpapayabong ng kanilang kaalaman at abilidad sa pagmamaneho. Ano ang student permit? Ang SP o student permit ay ini-issue sa mga nais mag-aral magmaneho. Ito ay isang requirement bago kumuha ng driver's license, non-professional man o professional. Para makakuha ng SP, kinakailangan dumaan sa 15-hour DDC. Liban pa sa mga requirements na medical certificate at kaukulang bayan dito. Ano ang TDC? Ang TDC o Theoretical Driving Course ay ang 15-hour seminar na kinakailangan daluhan na makukuha ng student permit. Nakapaloob dito ang mga bagay na dapat malaman ng mga nag-aaral magmaneho, lalo na ang batas trapiko. Makatutulong ang TDC para makasisiguro ang mga future drivers ay maalam. Hindi lamang kung paano magmaneho, kundi pati na rin kung paano manatili ligtas sa daan. Pangalawa ay roadworthy motor vehicle. Ang mga sasakyan na dapat ay inirehistro sa LTO ay dapat na dumaan sa masusing inspeksyon para sa kaligtasan hindi lang ng driver o ng may-ari ng sasakyan kundi pati na rin ang mga magiging sakay o pasahero nito at ng iba pang individual sa daan. Checkis muna bago bumiyahe. Pinaka-importante, registered bang sa sasakyan at may tamang documents. Always keep a copy of your official receipt and certificate of registration or ORCR. Taon-taon kailangan registrado ang kotse. Sa traffic discipline, ang bawat driver ng anumang sasakyan ay nararapat na maalam at marunong sumunod sa mga batas trafiko. Sa mga traffic signages at traffic rules sa saan mang lugar. Ang mga layunin kaugnay ng road safety ay hindi lamang trabaho ng iisang opisina, ahensya o sino mang nanunukulan. Ito ay shared responsibility nating lahat sa ating komunidad. Kaya dapat mayroong maayos na sistema ng komunikasyon ang national at lokal na pamalaan. Ang iba't iba pang mga ahensya o sangay ng gobyerno maging mga non-governmental organizations sa bansa ay dapat maroong matibay na community relations para sa isang mitingin tungkol sa road safety. Para naman sa legislative initiatives, katulong ng iba pang mambabatas sa Senado o sa mismong lahensya na nagpapatupad ng mga batas, dapat ay muli natin binibisita ang mga batas na pinaimplement para kung kailangan may idagdag o ay revise o kung kailangan gumawa ng panibagong batas para sa maayos na sistema natin sa trapiko, lansangan at mga sasakyan. Ikalawa, hindi dapat tayo mag-focus lamang sa mahigpit na pagpapatupad ng mga batas at regulasyon sa trapiko. Marapat din na meron tayong wasong pagpapakalat ng edukasyon o kaalaman sa publiko. Ang LTO po ay nagsasagawa ng mga road safety seminars sa maraming lugar. Grupo ng individual, grupo ng mga drivers, 
maging sa mga estudyante. Sa katunayan, inumpisahan po namin ang integration ng curriculum ng Road Safety Education sa K-12. Inumpisahan po namin ito sa School Division Office ng Quezon City at ninanais po namin na may pasapatok pa dito sa buong bansa. Naniniwala po kami na para makamtan natin ang tagumpay tungkol sa usapin na ito, isa sa solusyon ay sa maagang edad pa lamang. Dapat iminumulat na natin ang mga isipan ng bawat individual sa wastong gawi sa lansangan, bilang isang driver, pasahero, at maging isang ordinaryong gumagamit ng daan. Sabi nga nila, ligtas at angat ang may alam. Sa kasalukuyan, ang programa tungko sa modernisasyon ng mga pampublikong sasakyan ay pinatutupad na para sa mas ligtas na biyahe ng mga mamamamayang Pilipino. Ang programa ito ay masusing pinag-uusapan at pinagplanuhan ng masigasig na mga ahensyang responsable sa magandang layunin na ito. Ang LTO po ay naglunsad ng maikling video na maaari niyo pong mapanood patungkol sa aming road safety advocacy. Napapaloob po dito ang mga batas at regulasyon sa trapiko at transportasyon. Mga paalala at iba pang kaalaman na sigurado makakatulong upang makamit natin pagpapalawig ng edukasyon sa publiko kaugnay ng road safety. Na sa aming paniniwala ay isa ding makakatulong upang makamit natin ang bawat nating mithiin sa mas maayos na daan para sa lahat. Both sides, assemble! Pagkasakay, sabay-sabay, seatbelt. Ito ang magliligtas sa iyo in case of any emergency. Di lang driver ha, at di passenger seat, dapat naka-seatbelt. At kung meron para sa iba mong pasahero, mas maganda kung naka-seatbelt din sila. If you love your family, siguraduhin, securely fasten ang mga seatbelt sila. Thanks pa! At para kay Baby Francis, by law, dapat naka-child restraint system or child seat. At kung hindi natin alam, LTO reminds us, kapag 12 years and below ang edad, bawal nakaupo sa front seat. Pansin ninyo, kapag nagdadrive ako, nagsasalita ako. Pero hindi ko ginagalaw ang cellphone o ang camera ko. Focus lang ako sa driving. Dahil meron tayong anti-distracted driving on the road law. Bawal na bawal sa driver ang gumamit ng kahit anong communication devices habang nagda-drive siya. Allowed lang kung may hands-free. Pero hindi yung isusuot mo pa lang ha. No-no yun. Bawal hawakan. Kapag maganda ang prep, relax sa biyahe. By the way guys, tignan nyo pala. Hindi kami overloading. 5 people lang, sakto sa max capacity ng kotse. The LTO wants us to know na may motor vehicle road users charge law or also known as anti-overloading act para ito sa lahat ng sasakyan. And also, road safety na rin. Pag overloaded kasi, mas madaling maaksidente. This is to prevent smoke belching. Mauso kapag overloaded. Hirap kasi yung makina. And prevent premature deterioration of the road. Pag overloaded kasi, nakakasira ng kalye. So paalala lang guys, no to overloading.
Kuya Mon. Eh, hey, kamusta yung bagong driver? Ayos lang. Guys, ito na yung perfect chance para i-remind ang mga bike riders natin kung paano maging safe sa kalye. Umpisa natin sa helmet. Kahit ulit-ulitin. Helmet save lives. It is a look. Maiksi o mahaba man ang biyahe. Highway o malit na kalye. Kailangan naka-helmet. Needless to say, kapag nade-drive, bantayan ng bilis. Huwag over sa speed limit. Para sa dagdag safety nating lahat, ni-require ng ibang uri ng public utility vehicle at mga sasakyan na may speed limiter. Ito yung device na automatic na hindi hinahayaang lumagpas sa speed limit ang mga sasakyang kinabitan. Mayroon pa akong isang mahalagang paalala para sa ating mga driver of any age. Ito yung huwag kang iino pag magda-drive at bawal na kagamit ng drugs. By the way, don't do drugs at the first place, di ba? Sa batas, ang driver ng private vehicle, hanggang 0.05 blood alcohol concentration lang ang pwede. At sa public utility vehicle or motorcycle, 0.0 BAC. Tulong-tulong tayo para sa kaligtasan sa lansangan. Tungkulin ang bawat gumagamit ng kalsada ang maging disiplinado at responsable sa pagmamaneho at paggamit ng ating mga lansangan. Tandaan natin, LTO, Look, Tignan ng Sitwasyon, Think, Isipin ang Aksyon na Gagawin, Obey, Laging Sundin ang Batas Trapiko. Yan ang matalino, responsable at ligtas na driver at mamamayan. Tandaan, para sa kayusan at kaligtasan sa lansangan, maging disiplinado tayong lahat. Ang mga batas at alituntunin ay laging sundin at alamin. If there are high quality and safe drivers in the Philippines, then there will be safer vehicles for Filipino people and it will result to safer roads for everyone. Ang inyo pong lingkod, Pamela B. Arvasio from LTO and CR East. Thank you, Director Hervasio. We have our traffic signals and signs to warn and send us a clear signal to be alert and be safe on the road. As responsible road users, we must pay attention to this. How well do you respond to road signals? Tignan ang video, Kupol sa liwanag. Sa ating buhay, may mga liwanag na sa atin ay laging gumagabay. Sa ating pagising at pagtulog. Sa ating pag-alis at pag-uwi. Mga liwanag ng ating pagtigil. At pagpapatuloy. Mga liwanag na nagbibigay ng ngiti. At nagbibigay alaga. At may mga liwanag na patuloy na gumagabay kahit saan man tayo maglakbay. Ingatan ang sarili at ang iba. I-check ang headlights at taillights. At sumunod sa mga ilaw trapiko at iba pang panuntunan kapag nasa kalsada. Our next speaker is the Chairman of the Emergency Department and Trauma Center of the East Avenue Medical Center. Dr. Willie N. Saludares is also the head of several committees in EAMC, including the health, Hospital Health and Safety Committee and the Trauma Committee. To share with us the trauma and road crash services as a public health burden, we have Dr. Willie N. Saludares. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to introduce East Avenue Medical Center to our participants. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Thank you. Allow me to introduce the executive committee of the hospital, led, no, uh, back to the previous slide, please. Led by the medical center chief, Dr. Alfonso G. Nunez, and 
the other uh, heads of the divisions. Next slide, please. East Avenue Medical Center is a tertiary DOH hospital located in Quezon City with an approved bed capacity of 600. We are, however, waiting for a pending bill in the Senate, increasing our bed capacity to 1,000. This will greatly help our efforts to increase the services of the hospital. The accompanying budget and manpower complement will help us enhance our services even more once approved. Next slide, please. We have here the number of hospital admissions from 2017 to 2020. Note the decreased number of admissions in 2020 because of the pandemic. We had to limit the number of patients, of course, to control the spread of infection. Included in this slide are the number of patients admitted due to motor vehicular crash during the same period. This, however, is raw data because we are still improving our data gathering process, which we hope to improve with the full implementation of the trauma registry. Next slide, please. This slide shows the number of patients admitted due to trauma for the Department of Surgery from 2018, 2019, and 2020. Notice that we get a significant number of patients due to the injuries following a road traffic incident. Next slide. On this slide, we have the total number of vehicular crash patients seen and treated by the Department of Orthopedics, supporting the fact that limb injury is a significant result of vehicular crash. Next, please. The Department Order number 2021-0001 was issued by the Department of Health in January of this year, designating East Avenue Medical Center as an advanced comprehensive specialty center for trauma, together with cancer and dermatology care. Other departments were designated national specialty centers, namely burn care, eye care, and toxicology. Three other departments were designated as comprehensive specialty centers, and these are ortho, neonatal care, and mental health. As a result of this issuance, a body was formed to come up with guidelines and programs to achieve the goal of being a trauma center by 2024. This will include services for post-crash response. Next, please. The components of post-crash response has been represented repeatedly by the previous speakers. We agree 100% that post-crash response is an important ingredient in increasing the chance of survival of our patients after a vehicular crash. Next slide, please. This is just a closer view of the injury care phase, the post-crash response. Next, please. As mentioned previously, the draft copy of the trauma manual is still being finalized. And we are looking forward to working with the designated National Specialty Center for Trauma for consultation and alignment programs. A close coordination between the two medical centers and, of course, the other advanced and basic centers must be in place to function well in giving excellent trauma care to our constituents. Our emergency medicine department is working out on the curriculum for an EMS fellowship program which is aimed to start by year 2022. A two-year training program is being envisioned. While East Avenue Medical Center does not have a post-crash response at present, as a requirement for their graduation in emergency medicine, our senior residents are rotating at the local DRRMO office for their EMS experience, responding to trauma patients on the road and other emergencies. The department also has an outreach program teaching mass CPR to grade school and senior high school students just to give them the experience and added skills to identify emergency situations and respond if needed. A total of 5,506 participants were trained for the year 2019 to early 2020. We also include the non-medical staff of the hospital in our regular BLS trainings. Also, 
a standard first aid, basic first aid training is being given to our doctors and nurses, hopefully increasing our bystander responders on the road. A total of 130 personnel were trained on standard first aid in 2019 alone. Next slide, please. Allow me to go through some of the strengths of the hospital. Next slide. Quite several vehicular crash victims will be brought in with multiple injuries requiring care from different specialties. The East Avenue Medical Center is continuously improving the services that we can offer to our clients and hence the increasing number of training programs that we offer currently. As of now, we have 15 accredited residency training programs covering most of the specialty care needs of our trauma patients. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. There are currently 24 accredited fellowship programs, as you can see. Next slide. Next slide, please. We have two dedicated operating rooms for emergency cases. One is located at the main ER complex and another one at the newly constructed building currently being used for our COVID response. We have three post-anesthesia care unit beds available in each uh, theater. Next slide, please. Currently, we have eight major rooms two urology rooms, and one minor room at the main OR complex located at the fourth floor of the main building. The facility is underutilized at present due to a depleted manpower because of the pandemic. We are hoping that the bill allowing us to operate at 1,000 beds will be passed soonest so we can increase the pace of our sur surgical procedures. This is the common setup of the main OR theaters. Next, please. There are also 11 PACU beds or post-anesthesia care unit beds and four surgical ICU beds at the main OR complex plus an additional 13 medical ICU beds. The newly constructed building right beside the main building has 15 additional ICU beds being used currently for COVID patients. Next slide. The hospital has a fully equipped radiology pathology, and blood bank for our trauma, trauma response. Next slide. And lastly, the Department of Rehab Medicine is currently improving their equipment to keep up with the demands of the influx of patients. Our outpatient department is fully departmentalized to give the necessary continuation of care for our patients. East Avenue Medical Center is here to give a complete quality care for our patients. Next slide. Thank you very much for listening. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Saludares. Our next speaker is the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center, Dr. Marie Leo Fidel T. Pataray, is also the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the Batias H. Aznar Memorial College of Medicine since 2016 and the vice chairman for academic affairs for the Emergency Medicine Residency Training Program since 2012. To discuss with us road crash and injury surveillance, we have Dr. Marie Leo Fidel Pataray. Thank you very much. Uh, Good morning, everyone. In behalf of Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center and also to our Medical Center Chief, Dr. Gerardo M. Aquino Jr., we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the organizers of this AHEAD Road Safety Webinars, to the Department of Health, to the UP National Institute of Health, headed by Dr. Ted Herbosa, 
our mentor in emergency and disaster medicine, and also to Dr. Jinkilu for inviting BSMMC in sharing one of the best practices in the management of trauma crash victims in Central Visayas. Next slide, please. So the overview of my presentation is subdivided into three. First, allow me to present to you the 2019 BSMMC Online National Electronic Injury Sur Surveillance System or the ONES Index Report. Second, to present to you the current situation of health referral system in Cebu province. And lastly, to present to you the current practice of the management of trauma cases in our institution. The BSMMC St. Arnold Johnson was established and inaugurated in August of 2010. It is a four-story building which was donated by the University of San Carlos, one of the prestigious universities in the heart of the city, in response to the increasing number of trauma cases. This, next slide. The, at present, this center is managed by the Trauma Center Committee, headed by no other than our Medical Center Chief, supported by the Chief of Specialty and Subspecialty Services, and the Chairman of the different clinical departments. The main objective or the primary function of this committee is to provide a forum of development, strategy, and team building for the improvement of trauma care services in our region. Next slide. With the advent of the DOH Department Memorandum Number 2021-001, dated January 4, 2021, BSMMC is designated as a basic comprehensive trauma care. Thus, it will continue to innovate and strengthen its services in achieving the utmost care of trauma cases. Next slide. So let me present to you the 2019 BSMMC ONIS in, uh, Index Report. Uh, take note that this report was... Uh, um, taken or submitted during the pre-pandemic stage. For the year 2019, for the four, it is divided into four quarters. A total of 18,260 cases were reported. And this is very alarming that 34.5% or a total of 6,300 cases are related to crash, road crash injuries. Next slide. So for the age and distribution of these cases, a range 58% range from 15 to 39 years old. This is inconsistent um, report with the AHEAD Road Safety Research conducted by the UP National Institute of Health, in which it involves the young adol the, the adolescent and young adults and also those uh, ages with prime working age, and 72% or 4,544 were males. Next slide. As to the time of occurrence, of transport, or vehicular crash, 37% during occurs during rush hours at 8 a.m. to 12 noon and at 4 p.m. to 7.59 p.m. Then during the time of lighter traffic, wherein the motor motorist can drive faster. Next slide. For the place of occurrence, almost 98% occurs in the road, in the road uh, crashes. Next slide. For the mechanism of transport, 65% are non-collision, wherein 35% are collision. For the non-collision, this incidence usually occurs in the pedestrian, drivers who are under the influence of alcohol, those who do not follow the traffic rules, and in the province, it is also common the presence of stray animals, especially the dogs in the streets and even those uh, lack of signages during road repairs. 
Next slide. Now, for the distribution of type of vehicle, almost 72% are motorcycle-related crash injuries. The reported unknown, which has uh, 12% or 769, was not captured during the interview of the patient. Next slide. For the status of these patients upon arrival in the emergency room, 98% are alive. However, there are 60 cases who are unconscious, and unfortunately, there were 14 dead on arrivals. These 14 dead on arrivals, two of which had multiple injuries, eight are patients who did not wear uh, helmets, and four patients died in the pedestrian. Next slide. For the type of sustained injuries, taking note that most of these patients have multiple injuries, and hence they accounted according to the specific injuries they sustained. So with this report, 25% were fra fracture-related injuries. This is the reason why the census of the Department of Orthopedics has increased up to 300%. It also affects the increase in length of hospital stay, and the government is spending millions of pesos for the hospitalization of these needed patients. Take note that these fractured cases, the hospital is the one procuring the implants for them. Next slide. For the disposition, 67% were sent home. However, there are 20% uh, needs admission and 0.5% uh, uh, mor were mortalities. And there are 9% who signed consent for home against medical advice due to some reasons. Next slide. So let me present to you the current situation of the health referral system in the province of Cebu. So this is the standard health referral system as required by the universal health care law. According to the current data of the DOH-7 hospital licensing office, there are 19 primary health care facilities, 11 are district hospitals or level 1 hospitals. This involves the district and provincial hospitals in the province of Cebu, three city hospitals, the two DOH retained hospital, and one specialty hospital. Take note that below this one, only Vicente Soto is a level 3 or the end referral hospital, which caters more than 6 million population or Cebuanos. So this is a big challenge in our institution that uh, we need to step up in management of these trauma cases. With the help of our two linkages of health referral system, which is the electronic health referral system, this is the software system that uh, will all referrals will pass through in this uh, referral network. And for the EMS and the barangay ambulances, they need to call the hotline 711 before they can come in our institution. Next slide. We have the Emergency Department Operation Center. So this center it will all referrals, no, the health referral and phone referrals will pass through this one. But for the walk-in cases, no, especially for the barangay ambulances, with which these patients are stable, they need to call they need to call the hotline 711 even if they are already in front of our institution this is to teach them to follow the follow strictly the health referral system next slide so i would like to present to you this is the current setup of our uh, emergency department this caters 150 patients at one time this is not only uh, for uh, design for normal operation, but during mass casualty incidents. Next slide. So BSMLC is a teaching and training institution. There are 21 accredited fellowship and training residency, train residency training program. In the cutting specialties, there are eight accredited training programs that are involved in trauma response. These are the general surgery, neurosurgery, orthopedics, ENT, OFTA, plastic and reconstructive surgery, urosurgery, together with the Department of Anesthesia. 
we cannot avoid that these patients have an overlap of, uh, of management of these cases. In order to prevent tossing one patient from one, de from de one department to another, the trauma committee created the trauma team approach of management in which patients with multiple injuries that needs management of two or more uh, major department is admitted under trauma team. Now, the Department of Internal Medicine and in Pediatrics are also on, on board in the management of medical and pediatric comorbidities and preparation of the medical risk assessment in case these patients need to be operated. The Department of Emergency Medicine is in charge in resuscitating these patients in the emergency department. The Department of Pathology also is involved, is uh, on board for the stat diagnostic examination and including for the activation of the massive transfusion protocol in case this patient needs blood transfusion. Also, the, the Department of Radiology is on board, on board for the stat imaging uh, procedures. The Department of Respiratory Therapy Unit is in, on board in, uh, if the patient needs mechanical ventilation. And the rehab medicine is also in board, on board for the early physical rehabilitation of this patient. This is the holistic approach of trauma management in our institution. Next slide. Let me present to you the, the process flow in which multiple injuries are triaged and managed by the trauma team. However, if the patient has isolated injury, this will be triaged and managed by the specific clinical department. Next slide. Next slide, please. So we also conduct trauma rounds, usually every, every Friday at 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning. And also we do monthly uh, trauma audit and trauma conferences. Next slide. So as Dr. Silva has said, you know, prevention, you know, is of road crash injuries uh, and trauma-related cases by strictly implementing road safety laws by the proper authorities and for the community who are using the roads to strictly follow these laws are still far better prevention than cure. Next slide. Thank you very much. Or daghang salamat. Thank you, Dr. Pataray. We now have the Assistant City Administrator of the City Government of Davao. Attorney Tristan Dwight P. Domingo obtained his degree in political science and sociology at the University of the Philippines and earned his law degree in law at the Ateneo de Davao University. Immediately after passing the bar exam, he joined the City Legal Office of Davao in 2008. With his dedication and zeal in implementing the law, he handled the Transportation Regulatory Division and was appointed as officer in charge, office in charge of the Business Bureau under the City Mayor's Office. To discuss with us the local government road safety program in Davao, we have Attorney Tristan Dwight P. Domingo. Good morning, everyone. In behalf of the people of Davao City, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting us to share our city's experiences in implementing evidence-based research and programs in road safety. Next slide, please. Today, I will be presenting and offering the perspective from a local government unit and how we utilize evidences or data in general in governance and how we adapt and implement programs and projects based on the same to provide safer roads in our city. My presentation mainly revolves around one major project currently underway in our city, which is the High Priority Bus System Project, or the HPBS. As an LGU, we identify ourselves as one of the major implementers or key entities responsible for development. I will offer a glimpse to you on how we tackle and incorporate road safety into our communities. Uh, the outline of my presentation this morning is as shown. Next slide. In the previous sessions of this webinar, a lot has been said in terms of how important road safety is. Basically, we were told how unsafe it is for our life and limbs each and every time we step out of our homes. For us in Davao City, currently at the center of our road safety campaign is the adoption of a citywide bus system or the HPBS project. 
Prior to adopting such an initiative, in the year 2019, the city adopted its very own Davao City Transport Roadmap. The main thing for our city is to have an efficient travel time, a safer thoroughfare, and a healthier environment for all. In an effort to achieve the same, our city and community took conscious and concerted efforts in formulating the transportation roadmap. One may say that this roadmap serves as our highway to sustainable development in the city. Next slide, please. The city's transportation vision is basically to become a model city for the Philippines, a city which is a safe and sustainable transport system which enhances livability and improves connectivity. However, we also aim to prioritize non-motorized transport by identifying walking and cycling as a safe and viable first mode of choice for short trips. Hence, we seek to provide sufficient infrastructure that will make non-motorized or active transport more enjoyable and, of course, a lot safer. Our roadmap also seeks to make private vehicle use to be of the lowest priority in terms of road space use. Next slide, please. The conscious and ambitious transport directions that our city adopted did not come from an accident. These have been generated from var various studies conducted in the city. To highlight some of the more important ones were the Asian, four Asian Development Bank studies, which basically culminated into our city leaders deciding that a drastic improvement of the city public transportation system was needed to ensure that our, to ensure our city's sustainability. And of course, in order for our people to have safer roads. Next slide. To give you an idea of how big of a challenge it is for an LGU such as Davao City in terms of providing better and safer roads, here are relevant information or data which our city has. We have around 1.8 million people in the city and around 150,000 registered vehicles. However, only 3.8% of households in the city have private cars and of which 36.4% our motorcycles. Next slide, please. The city has around 2,400 kilometers of road network, and in terms of land area, it is often said that Davao City on its own is nearly four times Metro Manila size and probably around two and a half times bigger than Metro Cebu. We have 24 pedestrian overpasses or footbridges and around 75 major pedestrian crossings. However, we only have 30 laybys and more or less 60 signalized intersections. Not much, really not much in terms of actual infrastructures which will help us manage road traffic and ensure road safety to everyone. Next slide. Hence, by looking introspectively at the evidences and recommendations offered by various studies conducted in the city, we made a conscious effort to target one of the key things that we know for a fact will offer a lot in terms of improvement and contribute to a better, safer, and a more convenient way to travel in the city and that is the improvement of the city's public transportation. The data or evidence in our city tells us that we have more than 7,000 jeepneys that provide and serve as the main transportation mode of people in the city. Next slide. We focus on the improvement of public transportation because the evidence overwhelmingly shows that 80% of the trips in the city is made via public transportation. And yet, what was quite alarming and ironic for us was that the same percentage also, or 80% of vehicles on the roads are actually private cars and not public transportation vehicles. Hence, evidence suggests that there is a good opportunity for us to implement a project that will have an unquestionable beneficial impact to the people of Davao. We knew that when we introduce improvements for 80% of, of road users, we will be affecting a lot or improving a lot in terms of road safety. Next slide. In the city, we only have this data about road crash incidents. It came from the local PNP. Next slide. From it, it, uh, one can see that in the last five years, we averaged probably around 10,000 more or less uh, road crash incidents in a year, although majority of which lead only to damage to properties. However, at certain years, we had at least 100 deaths for traffic incidents, very high numbers. What was interesting and so alarming to us was when we tried to generate more data on traffic incidents. No one or no office, apart of course from our very able gentlemen in the local PNP, seems to provide us or was able to present to us a detailed and comprehensive database or information about road incidents in the city. Not really to put anyone or any specific office or entity into bad light, but our local LTO or even our very own city government traffic office 
did not have a complete and comprehensive list of road incidents in the city. That there raised a big red flag for, uh, for us. And perhaps the same is what is happening in, our, in your own localities. I know we saw some comprehensive data or, or information in some or most presentations that were made in this webinar, though I highly doubt that city-specific data or a more comprehensive traffic incident-based focus on major cities outside Metro Manila is available. To illustrate, we all know that a person who is involved in a road incident is required to undergo a very inconvenient and tedious process of getting a police report. He goes to the hospital when necessary and he retrieves uh, his driver's license from the police or LTO and then he processed the insurance claims and a lot more. And at the center of this rigorous process are some of the most evidence-rich piles of paper that contain information about the road incident that are so crucial in ensuring road safety in our country. The sad thing, however, for us is no single entity nor a concrete data processing flow has been adapted in our country to process all this wealth of information. As there is no reliable database, we fail to generate and utilize the much needed data to help to improve road safety in the country. There is this wealth of unfiltered or unprocessed data that is available for us that we are neglecting. Anyway, uh, back to my presentation. Next slide, please. So why then did uh, Davao City really chose to prioritize its public transportation system to help improve road safety in this country? This slide here is the why. The evidence shows that next to private vehicles, passenger vehicles or public transportation vehicles, specifically jeepneys and tricycles, comprise the second most accident or ac accident-involved vehicle type. Hence, this data tells us that by prioritizing improvement of public transportation, we will significantly impact, specifically lessen road accidents or incidents in the city. Of course, most people will ask, why not target the private vehicles, which is far and away the vehicle type which is the most accident prone? Well, for one, regulating private vehicles or instituting stricter regulations about private vehicle ownership and its use is a very hard undertaking for a mere local government unit to make. We believe for a truly game-changing and meaningful initiative, a more nationwide approach, a congressional act is needed to adapt important legislations to regulate the same. Further, for us in Davao City, we think that by deliberately focusing on providing a world-class public trans transportation system, similar perhaps to the one in, to the cities in Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, etc., we think that we may all be also be able to encourage private car owners to abandon their private cars and choose the more sustainable mode of transport, which is public transport. Hence, as less cars are used, the amount of accidents that these types of vehicles are involved will surely lessen as well, thereby affording safer roads for everyone. Next slide. So in our city, apart from introducing very drastic reforms by removing all public utility jeepneys in the city, and replacing them with modern buses, we also put a premium on non-motorized or active transport. The slide shown before us, before us shows one of the more deliberate initiatives we have adapted, adapted years ago to ensure pedestrian road safety. Next slide. At this point, allow me to present some specific about our HPBS project in the city. As part of the road safety initiatives of the HPBS project, the project, uh, next slide please. Or previous slide, previous slide. As part of the road safety initiatives of the HPBS project, the project includes a drive creation of a driving school and this government run school or training facilities envisioned to provide the much needed to theoretical as well as actual or hands on know how for anyone who desires to become a public transport or bus driver in the city. The HPBS project will require NC2 or 3 certified dri drivers before operating or becoming a bus driver. Next slide. To further provide a basis for affirmation to the city's deliberate approach to improve public transportation, the Department of Transportation data shows that in our country as a whole or nationwide, jeepneys are 10 times more likely to get into accidents than private cars. We know that this may contradict actual data in our city, but then again, we should get the hint or the picture. Better public transport lead to lesser road accidents. Next slide, please. Hence, our may, main road safety approach is the improvement of our public transportation system in the city. Next slide. The HPBS project in our city is a public transportation system. Next slide, please. 
this, that combines the capacity, reliability, and speed of a metro line with flexibility, lower cost, and simplicity of a bus system. Next slide. It comprises 29 routes with over 1,000 new and modern buses to replace all 7,000 plus jeepneys in the city. Next slide. The project requires five bus stops a bus, five bus depots and three terminals and the aforementioned driving school. Currently, we are in on the detailed engineering design stage with the thousand buses projected to become operational by the fourth quarter of 2023. Next slide. The slide this slide shows the entire bus network which, which will serve the city. And next slide. This, will, this slide shows the locations of the depots and their driving school. Next slide. This slide offers a glimpse on the possible layout of the driving school or training and testing facility. Next slide. Bus lanes similar to the one shown in the slide will also be identified in the city to reduce bus delays, improve passenger travel time, reliability, and fewer required vehicles on the road. The project is also expected to provide better pedestrian safety in crossings or intersections. Next slide. Currently, the construction of bike lanes are also underway. The initial route or Area of, of these bike lanes is shown in the map, and the two pictures in the screen are actual photos where these bike lanes are already present. Next slide. There will be a thousand bus stops in the city. It will be wheelchair accessible and is designed to be gender sensitive with, it, with incorporated safety features. Hence, it is designed to be well lit and most, mostly transparent to provide for better visibility to prevent crime. Next slide. The project also recommends for construction of a at least six more footbridges to offer safer walkways for pedestrians amidst the buses on the roads. Next slide. The next slide. These slides uh, show the different pedestrian improvements to be introduced in the city. At least a thousand of these pedestrian improvements, mostly zebra cross crossings or pedestrian lanes with uh, smart signalized uh, features will be built all over the city. Next slide. Yeah, next. Okay. In sum, there really is a lot to look forward to in terms of road safety initiatives in the city. And at the heart of this is the implementation of the HVBS project. We in the city would like to highlight that in order for us to improve road safety, our community has to provide or organize for a more consistent or standardized way of reporting road incidents to enable us to utilize data analytics in our road safety initiatives. No entity seems to focus on the data management and analytics of traffic incidents in the country. We also believe that there is a need for better coordination across all agencies, especially the LGU, the OTR, and DPWH in terms of identifying and implementing projects. Road safety infrastructure designs must also be standardized and required, like requiring drainage systems, bike lanes, adequate si sidewalks in all future road improvements. We also think that our community must provide a more comprehensive transport, education, communication, and support to everyone. In our country, we have a very limited amount of transportation or traffic experts. Or even if we do have them, most of them are working abroad or in, are in the academe. We need more of these experts to become more of implementors or actively join us in implementing the much needed reforms we need in the country to provide safer roads for everyone. Finally, we think that we must provide appropriate funding, funding and resources to this road safety initiative. We must not continue to compromise or skimp on funding and still expect safer roads. We must be daring, bold, and committed to implementing truly meaningful and game-changing projects. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Attorney Domingo. You have shown us some best practices in road safety and a way forward for other local government units. According to the World Health Organization, pedestrians represent 26% of all deaths due to road crash. In the Philippines, based on our study with Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, pedestrians also comprise 20 to 25% of all road crash deaths. Globally, pedestrians die at a rate of one for every five seconds. See a video about pedestrians. Ito si Macy. Si Macy masipag. Masipag siya mag-workout, 
Masipag rin magluto ng healthy para sa family. Masipag siya kahit sa hygiene at self-care. At sa eskwela, mas sinisitagan pa niya. Naku, mukhang kailangan tumawid ni Macy. Kaunting lakad na lang, may pedestrian crossing na. Sisipagin pa rin kaya si Macy? Kung masipag sa bahay at eskwela, bakit hindi sa kalsada? Alagaan ng buhay, maging masipag kahit sa pagtawid sa tamang lugar. Your best decision is prioritizing your safety. Tandaan, alagaan ang buhay, maging masipag, tumawid sa it- itinakdaang daan. Our next speaker is the appointed executive director of the Policy Center. She worked as the project manager of the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety, Legal Development Program Philippines. She was also an active guide in updating the Philippine Road Safety Action Plan 2017 to 2020. Please welcome Executive Director Maria Fatima A. Villena. Said, I will focus more on the process of coming out with evidence to assist decision making, such as the passage of the EMSS Act, as this is how we're trained by the UP Manila College of Public Health, and which is also the main topic for today's webinar. I believe that the head program is using the same principles and discipline, thus researches such as the ones doc- by Dr. Herbosa and you were approved. According to the study, people view evidence as those that are factual and are concrete information that can support a decision. Contrary to arbitrary decision making, Evidence-informed policymaking uses the best available evidence there is to provide insights and guide decision-making. Policy analysts like us collect both formal and informal literatures as sources of our evidence. We validate the information, and from the collection, we come out with our own analysis for presentation. Going further, if we think that our policy recommendation is sound, informed by then evidence gathered, then policy analysts turned advocates take this to the arena of of advocacy armed with appropriate persuasion strategies to increase support and demand and campaign for the passage of the recommended policy. In addition, right timing and proper venue is also crucial if we wanted our policy passed. In evidence-informed health policy, there are two possible processes that can be used. First, the pattern and Sawiki six-step poli- process in policy analysis, or the Weimar and Beaning steps in the rationalist mode policy analysis process. For my paper, I combine the two in developing my proposal. First, I am going to discuss the framework, then policy issue, goals, policy option, and my policy recommendation. The framework used for this study is the use, is the safe system approach of road safety, while focusing on the gaps and challenges found in the pre-hospital care or those encountered at the scene of the crash before the patient is transferred at the most appropriate treatment facility. And we all know that post-crash response or care is the fifth pillar of road safety. It is the last attempt to save a life when all else fails to prevent a road crash from happening. And I also use the WHO emergency care system framework as my gold standard or basis for the policy recommendation. After identifying the framework and standards that I used in my analysis, it is time to identify the policy issue. In most care, post-crash care, what seem to be the gaps and or challenges at the moment? So we all know that in pre-hospital care, the, pro- the following are the components. Upon research and study of the current materials, 
I came to the conclusion that the current policies for emergency care would be needing the strength of a law to institutionalize standards and protocol. This is the policy issue. Currently, we have DOH Administrative Order Number 2014-0007 and 2018-0001 that govern the pre-hospital emergency medical services system. This supposedly should help set up the said systems across LGUs. However, the capacities of LGUs to respond to emergencies are not all the same due to various factors, but one key component may be financing. This conclusion or observation came from my understanding of the findings of the assessment study prior to the development of the mentioned AO commissioned by the DOH. It was the same assessment study that was the basis for the development of the administrative order. In my policy paper, I have also gathered experts' opinion as part of my evaluation and evidence building. I have interviewed representatives from the Philippine College of Emergency Medicine, Philippine Society of Emergency Medical Technicians, and Dr. Ted Herbosa. And these for them are the gaps in pre-hospital care implementation. At the scene of the crash, activation of the right responders in a timely manner is needed. This is the only time when emergency care starts. Heavy traffic is a major barrier in responding to road crashes. Lack of training of both dispatcher and responder is also a challenge. There is also no established protocol on how to handle trauma. There, these are very, there are very poor standards of care with virtually no medical direction and that the work needed to be done is way beyond the scope of practice of for, for emergency medical technicians. While in transport, ambulances are generally poorly equipped and manned. Very often, just badly converted family vans with little or no provision for patient care. There is also inadequate training of first responders. Therefore, there is lack of patient care. In the transfer to the health facility, there seemed to be lack of coordination between responder, dispatch center, and the, and the health facility where the patient will be brought to. Inadequate resource also contributes to the challenges in pre-hospital care. So after identifying the policy issue, what then will be the goals? In health policy, we were trained to look into the goals that we wanted answered by our policy recommendation. For my policy paper, I chose three. The first is, a sa is the safety goal. The policy recommendation must ensure that road crash victims receive appropriate care to help stabilize their vital functions for their survival while in transport from one facil facility to another. The criteria to meet this goal are crowd control management, basic life support applied by a properly trained personnel, response time should be within the time that, could, that life could be saved, and disability is kept to a minimum. For example, in Makati, it recorded a response time of six to eight minutes during daytime and three to five minutes during nighttime. Proper patient assessment, use of appropriate or well-converted ambulance, and application of sufficient patient care to complete the cycle of care and ensure survival of patient while in transit to the health facility and or next in case of referral. My next policy goal is efficiency. The policy recommendation must be able to establish a well-functioning coordinating system in collaboration with the other emergency personnel, from pre-hospital to acute and or definitive care to ensure seamless navigation for patients and their families. The criteria for this is to set up a well-coordinated emergency dispatch system to emergency response and care, to the arrival of appropriate transport, and lastly, to the delivery of stabilized patient in the appropriate health facility.
My last goal is equity. The policy recommendation must ensure that, equali that quality post-crash care and response is standardized for all localities, first to six class municipalities or cities. The criteria is to measure the goal. The criteria to measure the goal is when all LGUs are able to set up a minimum standard EMSS, regardless of their economic status as a municipality and or city. What are the policy options? For the policy option for the decision maker, either a legislator or implementer, there are three to choose from. First is to improve the current pre-hospital EMS that we have. This is the status quo. Second is to use or the use of national or local and DRRM set up for the EMSS. So this is an option to integrate the EMSS under the DRRM system and structure. Well, in my first 2020 presentation, I recommended this setup and policy option because it already has a law or a mandate. It has a funding such as the Calamity Fund and almost all LGUs have set their city or municipality DRRMs. However, for this webinar, I would like to explore the third option, which is setting up an entire standalone EMSS either by government or using a third party provider. What does this mean? A standalone EMS system means setting up the entire system. There are three models to choose from. Through quasi-government model under the Philippine Red Cross, the NGO model, uh, which is done in Cebu and in Bacolod, or within the government's health system, as now encouraged by the passage of the universal healthcare law. The EMSS also means institutionalized standards and protocol. In building our pre-hospital care EMS system, I use the emergency care network framework of WHO. In building a standalone EMS, whether it is via Philippine Red Cross, an NGO or government, the key elements that must be present are as follows. Good leadership and governance, one that can develop and enforce appropriate regulations such as standards and protocols, a reliable and accurate information management system, a functional coordinative mechanism, and of course, infusion of investments, funds, including capacity building of EMS teams. As policy analysts and advisors, we have a responsibility to evaluate our policy recommendation and inform the decision maker about it. For a standalone EMS, unlike the DRRM integration, there are a lot that needs to be set up. I believe the pros have been best illustrated in the one command center set up for COVID-19. According to PSEM, setting up an EMS system would mean the focus is on medical response or care that can improve outcome, easier implementation, easier auditing because it will be only one department, dissemination of information will also be easier, and a medical director will be one of its heads. The cons, however, are it is cost inefficient, a separate budget is needed, and sustainability issues may arise due to fast attrition rate of staff. The goal criteria and result of the evaluation of the policy option are then placed into a matrix, such as the one that is right in front of you, to clearly show the results. As for the standalone option, further evaluation is needed but I believe the answers or the results of the measures just need to be gathered to see the complete picture. For example, in the safety goal, most results are moderate to high since this is a new system, a new setup, and that the use of appropriate ambulances can now be further regulated across LGUs. However, we also know that it is not easy to set up a new system. Those who are involved need to be capacitated and that EMS personnel need to be produced and should increase in number. Plantilla position for emergency care in health facilities are also needed. This need funding and investment infusion in a timely manner. Another thing that needs to be evaluated is political acceptability, 
which might be more acceptable now than before pandemic days because we already saw the need and value for such a system. With this recommendation, I argue that corollary laws are needed to be passed as well, such as the Good Samaritan Law and the creation of the National Transportation Safety Board, which will establish road crash investigation in the Philippines in all forms of transportation. At present, there is a current update on the EMSS Act, which can be a new point for consideration. Aside from the EMSS value highlighted during this pandemic, the DOH made the EMSS Act a priority bill for this 18th Congress. The action to be taken by the law is to establish a national standard for emergency medical services and ensure its accessibility. The salient provisions of the laws are of the law are the following: creation of EMSS Council, creation of a national emergency hotline number, creation of plantelia positions for emergency medical services personnel in government hospitals and health facilities. Mandating emergency medical vehicles to follow DOH Administrative Order Number 2018-0001, establishment of emergency dispatch centers by the LGU, and ensure availability of emergency transport vehicles with qualified EMS following Recording DOH stopped. guidelines and the council. This is the end of my presentation. I hope that my presentation has shed light into how evidence can assist government along with the other considerations and pushing for laws that can save lives, such as the EMSS Act. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Villena. Director Edward Cunanan Gonzalez was appointed as Recording the head of the Road Emergency Group of the MMDA in 2009 by the Chairman Bayani Fernando. Since then, the Road Emergency Group has evolved its function from giving assistance and manpower to disaster response and clearing of the main thoroughfares in Metro Manila, to responding and assisting in road-related emergencies and obstructions. To represent Director Edward Gonzalez, we have the Deputy Head of the Road Emergency Group, Hannah Kathleen Zaballero. She obtained her postgraduate diploma on disaster preparedness and reconstruction from the University of Newcastle. Hannah Kathleen Zaballero. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. To DOH and AH. Thank you for inviting us to this a series of webinar on road safety, a decade of success ahead. Today, I'm going to discuss the post-crash post response of MMBA. Let me introduce you to our unit, the Road Emergency Group. Next slide, please. Road Emergency Group was created and tasked to conduct the emergency roadside operations along the major thoroughfares of Metro Manila and ensure the free flow of traffic along EDSA and other designated major thoroughfares in the metropolis, hence saving the lives and limbs of vehicular roadside victims. Next, please. Our vision is to create a metropolis where people can avail an efficient roadside emergency response through quick response to post roadside emergencies, thereby in preventing and mitigating the occurrence of road traffic buildup and by reducing exposure to risk. Next slide, please. Our mission is to remove all accident-related roadblocks and other obstacles, thereby ensuring the unimpeded flow of traffic along the main thoroughfares in Metro Manila. Next slide, please. Our objectives are to provide efficient and quick emergency response to roadside emergencies within 15 minutes quick response time in Metro Manila. Another is to ensure the free flow of traffic along the major thoroughfares by removing all roadblocks and other obstacles. Next, please. The functions of REC are divided into five. Here is our main function, road emergency response. We respond within the 15-minute quick response time to reported road emergencies like vehicular accidents, vehicular fire, and other accidents that may occur to commuters and pedestrians alike along the road, through administering of pre-hospital care before a victim is conducted to a medical facility for further management and treatment, and the initial clearing of the scene or incident accident area. 
we shall also provide ambulance service and emergency emergency transport of patients whenever deemed necessary or as required and they perform such other functions as directed next please another functions of road emergency group is road clearing operations emergency roadside towing and clearing within 15 minutes of reported stolen vehicles or vehicles involved in accidents and other road obstacles through the use of our tow trucks forklift units and other emergency heavy equipment along EDSA and other thoroughfares in metro manila this is to ensure the free flow of traffic thus contributing to the overall improved traffic situation next please we also cater and provides needed vehicle and equipment and manpower for both local and national events such as the feast of black nazarene annual shikiro exercises asean meetings international conferences state of the nation address and other events next please. next slide please we also have the treatment of walk-in patients, and we also provide the needed conduction of these walk-in patients through our ambulance units and other rescue vehicles. Next, please. Road Emergency Crew also caters humanitarian assistance to disaster events. We assist in the conduct of operations before, during, and after the disaster victims brought about by the occurrence of calamities like floods, typhoon, earthquake, and landslide, not only here in Metro Manila, but as well as in different provinces in the Philippines, and as per instruction of the chairman. Next, please. Here are some of the um, pictures of our um, humanitarian assistance to different parts of the country. Next, please. Next, please. To be fully functional, Road Emergency Group is composed of the following. The head, which is Director Edward C. Gonzalez, Deputy Head, the admin staff, group leaders, duty officers or radio operators, the nurses, medic rescue personnel, with the plantilla position of medical services assistants, we also have the heavy equipment operators, the transport officers, the assistants and the crew, and also the mechanics. Next. Road emergency stations and its strategic locations. Road Emergency Group have seven, has seven emergency stations, but currently, due to the pandemic, we only have five operational ones because of limited manpower. Hopefully, by the third quarter of this year, we are able to open the last two stations. These stations are located in strategic areas along EDSA and secondary thoroughfares. It is located under the bridges for us to have access in both lanes, hence providing a fast and efficient response and also to attain our 15-minute quick response time. The locations of our emergency stations are the following. We have Rescue Orense along EDSA Orense Street, Guadalupe, Makati City. Rescue Timog along EDSA Timog Avenue, Quezon City. Rescue Edsa Ortigas along Edsa Ortigas, Mandaluyong City. Rescue Rojas along Edsa, Rojas Boulevard, Manila. Rescue C5BBs along C5BBs, Quezon City. Rescue Commonwealth along Commonwealth Avenue, Tandang Sora, Quezon City. And Rescue Nagtahan along Ramon Magsaysay Boulevard, Lacson, Santa Mesa, Manila. Next, please. For our assets and resources, we have ambulance units, Tow trucks, wreckers, fire trucks, man lift, crane, generator sets, chainsaw, water treatment plant, mounted type, military trucks, rescue van, extrication tools, and rescue bikes. Next, please. For our operational control and supervision for road emergency response, let me discuss to you our workflow chart of emergency response. Next, please. MMDA receives emergency calls from traffic enforcers deployed in the field, um, from private citizens, 911, and other rescue group or local DRRMO. These are the information usually given or asked by the radio operators. The address location or the landmarks of the incident, the type of incident, give the appropriate type of accident, is it vehicular accident, stole vehicles, or any other type of incident. Victims, the quantity and condition of the victim. Resources needed, is there a need for more traffic constables, ambulance, car trucks, tow trucks, local police for security, or barangay officials. 
These calls are being filtered by the Metro Base through, red, through radios and MMDA hotline 136. Metro Base will then coordinate the emergency calls to our rescue base. Rescue Base as the central dispatch unit of road emergency group will receive the call. Radio operators from Rescue Orense, where the rescue base is located, will call the emergency station nearest to the incident area. Rescue base will then call back Metro Base for the dispatch of ambulance unit or other needed resources to the incident area. When the dispatched unit arrives at the post-crash area, the responding team will coordinate the rescue base to relay information about the patient, quantity, and condition. This is to know if they needed additional resources or specialized tools. Further, this kind of information is needed or used for the endorsement of victims to a medical facility. Upon receiving of the information from the responding team, the radio operator will coordinate with the nearest government hospital or any medical facility. Rescue base will call back the responding team for the receiving doctor. This ensures the smooth flow of endorsement of victims to a medical facility. In addition, calling the medical facility before the team arrives ensures that the hospital still has the capacity to accept the victim or if they have the specialized equipment in treating and examining the patient. Upon arrival of the responding team to a medical facility, they will look for the receiving doctor and they will um and they will endorse the patient properly. So next slide, please. So I think this is our last slide. So with that, I give you our mantra. We exist to assist so that others will. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Operations Officer Haldon and uh, Deputy Director Zabaliero. Today, we will share some key initial results from our program. And also, uh, we would like to introduce to you our next speaker, Director Haldon. The Central Communications and Emergency Response Center, or Central 911, is the product of the collaborative efforts between the city government of Davao and Davao Light Power Company. This is to address the increasing crime rates and campaign for a more stable peace and order. Currently, it provides law enforcement assistance, pre-hospital care, search and rescue services, and fire suppression. All these emergency response services are free of charge. As a general rule, only trauma or medical emergency cases shall be transported by Central 911. Patients may be transported to other medical facilities if preferred or deemed necessary. Central 911 is composed of four units, namely Emergency Calls Answering Point and Dispatch, Emergency Medical Services, Urban Search and Rescue, and Fire Auxiliary Services. In addition, the 911 hotline is the main entry point in dispatching for police assistance. The Central 911 is also active in supporting other national agencies through auxiliary services and augmenting other emergency resources. The Emergency Calls Answering Point and Dispatch, or the ECAPD unit, serves as a command center and comprises both call-taking and dispatching functions. The unit is mainly responsible for receiving emergency calls and logging appropriate information. The system utilized by the unit can pinpoint the location of the emergency accurately on the Geographic Information System map. Furthermore, the dispatch section under the ECAPD unit facilitates and coordinates with the appropriate agencies 
for some instances. The Emergency Medical Services, or the EMS unit, serves as an integral part of Central 911 since it is predominantly in charge of rendering life-saving pre-hospitals procedures on-site and during transit and facilitating the transfer of patients to a nearby hospital. For the most part, the Urban Search and Rescue Unit performs rescue and complex emergency response operations such as road crash extrication, high-angle and low-angle technical rescue, collapse structure search and rescue. Each operation and emergency response situation of Central 911 is guided by an on-scene management system adopted from the Incident Command System or the ICS. All rescue and response activities are also guided by this system. The USAR unit is equipped with advanced rescue resources and tools to handle these various rescue operations efficiently. The Fire Auxiliary Services or the FAS unit is mandated to prevent and suppress cases of fire incidents here in Davos City. The FAS unit is guided by a set of protocols aligned with the fire code of the Philippines and in conformity with other relevant national laws. Moreover, the unit comprises highly technical firefighters who are well trained to respond to complex fire operations involving high rise buildings and structures. Central 911 has continued to boost its capabilities by establishing satellite stations and procuring different vehicles to address the emergency needs of Davaoenos. Strategic satellite stations are created to cater to emergencies in different parts of Davao City in a much shorter response time. Central 911 has five stations located in Kalinan, Panakan, Kabantian, Toril, and Marahan. For the 911 vehicles, the EMS unit has 17 basic life support ambulances, five advanced life support ambulances, two advanced cardiac life support ambulances, and one ambulance bus. The USAR unit has three quick response rescue vehicles, one search and rescue troop carrier, one equipment vehicle, four rescue trucks. One of the unit's function is to respond during vehicular crashes. For this reason, their vehicles are equipped with power and rescue tools specially designed for extrication purposes. The FAST unit has seven trucks, two boom trucks, one wing van, two area ladder trucks, and two rescue trucks. In many occasions, trucks involved in vehicular crashes containing oil and other chemicals that may spill on the road which is highly dangerous. The unit is then responsible for managing and cleaning the road. During road crash accidents, after dialing 911, the 911 call taker will then get the initial information of the incident. The call taker will alert the dispatcher to issue a dispatch order to the concerned units and will report the incident to the nearest police station. The average time of a central 911 unit to reach the incident from the Sandawa base is 13 minutes and 21 seconds. Further, the average travel time from the incident location to the trauma center is 13 minutes and 59 seconds. One of the major factors that really really contribute to the numbers of our response time is the traffic congestion here in Davao City. In 2019, the ECAPD unit received or quantified a total number of 8,657 calls pertaining to road crash in Davao City. The Central 911 units cater to precisely 19,027 patients and 3,932 of those are patients who were involved in road crash in 2019. And here is the breakdown of road crash 
patients in 2019. There are a total of 3,932 patients in the year 2019 in Davao City. Out of the 3,932 patients, 2,637 of those were transported to the hospital by the EMS crew. 955 patients did not need medical care and refused transport. 290 cases were classified as back-to-base since these cases might not need rescue and transport. 34 individuals were called black on the spot and 16 patients were treated on-site only. The whole Metro standard guidelines provide rescue technicians with detailed information about vehicle extrication techniques. They follow the SHADE formula, which minimizes risk to patients handled by extricating in a controlled manner and without creating any more significant damage. SHADE is an acronym that stands for Size Up, Stabilization, Scene Management, Safety, Hazard Control, Access, Assess, Assist, disentanglement and extrication. By applying shade, rescue technicians will better control the road crash scene. Here are some of the vehicular crashes that the Central 911 team has responded to. And for our challenges, the pandemic has really affected our response time. The emergency medical technicians will need to undergo proper doning and doffing for every run, causing necessary delays to our response time. From 2 minutes and 15 seconds pre-COVID period to 6 minutes and 45 seconds COVID-19 period. In the last quarter of 2017, Central 911 has implemented a new approach to reduce the response time. It is by strategically identifying and assigning locations for its resources within a certain radius. The red circles indicate the existing stations of Central 911. The green circles indicate prepositioned personnel and the yellow circles are the barangay resources or other agencies. In certain circumstances, especially during traffic congestion and in areas inaccessible to regular ambulances, the EMS unit deploys the Fast Reaction Emergency Medical Services, or what we call the FREMS personnel. FREMS are motorcycle riding emergency medical technicians equipped with medical and trauma pre-hospital care jump kits. They provide initial pre-hospital interventions before the arrival of regular ambulance and at times will escort any available vehicle to transport patients to the hospital when needed. To enhance our ECAP these capabilities, we have partnered with Carbine. Carbine is a public safety technology. It is a 911 cloud-based call handling platform that delivers advanced IP-enabled communication features, IoT gateways, and state-of-the-art caller solutions. As you can see in the video, this is how Carbine being used by Davaoenos. Kanang crossing lang jud sa ma'am no. Opo ma'am, road lang jud sa ma'am. Ani gyud sa. Paliog na lang ko ma'am na ay padulong din na on board na ba ma'am? Nakita niyo ambulance? Mo na na. Kita niyo? Wala ko ma'am, barangay lang man isa. 
We have effectively put up a public relations team and one of their functions is to regularly update real time the citizens with emergencies responded to by the Davos City Central 911 team, such as fire, a vehicular crash, or even flooding. During a vehicular collision, citizens are alerted of the location of the incident and are being reminded of possible traffic congestion which will help them avoid the area and minimize the traffic. Central 911 has created a special operations group with qualified personnel to undertake rescue missions outside the city. The main objective of the platoon is to handle and manage collapse structure, search and rescue operations properly. The SOG's first batch comprises 8 rescue medics from the USAR unit and 8 fire medics from the FAST unit. They have completed their 25 days of emergency medical technician B training. And lastly, our ACLS training. In partnership with Southern Philippines Medical Center or the SPMC's Emergency Medical Department, seasoned doctors from all over the Philippines trained Davao City Central 911's advanced emergency medical technicians with in-depth knowledge of managing advanced cardiovascular life support cases. This training is conducted every year since 2017. After finishing the course, EMTs will become eligible in administering cardiovascular medicine and proper management of life-threatening cardiac conditions. That would be all. Dagang salamat o maayong adlaw sa inyong tanan. Thank you, Director Emmanuel uh, R. Haldon, Chief Operations Officer of Davao City. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Philippine Red Cross. My co-host, Dr. Jinky Leilani Lu, shared some key initial results from this program with Dr. Theodora J. Herbosa in our previous webinars. Dr. Jinky Lu is a research professor at the National Institutes of Health, UP Manila. She has authored two books, first, Gender Information Technology and Health, which won the National Academy of Science and Technology Book Award in 2010 and was reprinted by the University of Hawaii Press in 2007. And second, The Basics of Occupational Health and Safety, Guidebook for Practitioners and Industries, published by UP Press. She has also produced 50 journal articles, all of which are science citation indexed, thus earning her the title of university scientist from 2007 to the present. She is currently the secretary and the next chair of, the scientific, of a scientific committee of the International Commission on Occupational Health. Dr. Liu is a staunch advocate, both as an engaged academic and scientist in promoting well-being among vulnerable populations, such as the road users. To provide us a summary of the program results and introduce the research and webinar team, and challenge us for a call of action on road safety, we have Dr. Jinky Leilani Lu. Now, we come to the conclusion of our webinar. Indeed, it has been a great pleasure on our part to have all of you in our webinar series one to four. To reiterate, the aim of our project is to come up with the epidemiology of road crashes and injuries in major tertiary hospitals in the Philippines, covering Metro Manila, Cebu, and Davao regions, and create a road safety index. We discuss all this in webinars one to three. As discussed previously, the program covered four major databases for at least the past 10 years. First, the ISIS database of UPPGH consisting of 4,979 road crash patients. Second, the head hospitals where our research assistants encoded medical charts of road crash patients from the eight largest tertiary hospitals in the country consisting of 40,286 patients. Third, the ONACE database of the Department of Health where an average of 304 hospitals nationwide upload their injury data, consisting of 296,790 vehicular crash patients. And fourth, the MARAS dataset of the MMDA, consisting of 1.35 million road crash incidents. This is complemented 
by about 20,000 data points of road crashes from the Philippine National Police and the Department of Public Works and Highways for Cebu and Davao. These are the trends of road crashes, injured persons from road crash, and killed persons across all data sets. In the ISIS, the number of road crash patients increases by 21% on the average every year. There's also a 426-fold increase in patients admitted between 2008 and 2017. In the ONAs, the number of road crash patients admitted to the 304 hospitals increases by 25.58% on the average per year. Transport and vehicular crashes account to 27 to 40% of all injury cases. In the AHEAD database, road crash accounts to about 3,300 patients brought to the hospitals per year. In the MARAS, the number of road crash incidents increased by 32.95% between the years 2005 and 2019. And on the average, there is an increase of 4.71% on the number of road crashes every year. For all the road crash incidents, the total number of injured persons is 623,314. This is more than half million Filipinos injured on the road, affecting the individual, the household, and the society as a whole. For death or fatality, the data shows the following. In PGH ICs, there is a total of 166 fatal patient outcomes. In AHEAD hospitals, a total of 5,255 fatal patient outcomes. In ONAs, a total of about 1,400 emergency room deaths and about 1,100 inpatient deaths. In MARAS, total drivers killed is 2,775, total passengers killed is 847, and total pedestrians killed is 2,661. Across all databases, the total number of killed persons from road crash is 14,352. It is a large number of people needlessly dying from a road crash incident that could have been prevented. Due to the increasing number of deaths on road crash, there is a need to formulate policies on road safety focusing on the following. Adopt a safe systems approach, undertake a road safety management capacitation, build good road safety infrastructure and ensure efficient mobility, and advocate and enforce road safety behaviors including stricter sanctions for violations. These policies should be implemented, otherwise they will have no effect at all on road safety. Our data shows that 75% of patients are brought to hospitals via private vehicles. Only 16% are brought by ambulance and 3% by police vehicles. There is a need to amplify and improve pre-hospital response. The golden R to increase the chance of survival and decrease possible fatalities is considered critical. Our data shows that majority of victims are within the 20 to 39 age groups, the prime working age. Increased fatality and disability in this age group has economic consequences from loss of productivity. Our data shows that motorcycles are the most involved vehicle type in road crashes between 58 to 81 percent across all data sets. Motorcycles are also the most involved vehicle for crashes involving the pedestrian. There is a need to create a policy which will increase safety for motorcycle riders and their potential victims. Controlling the number of motorcycles on the road, dedicated motorcycle lanes, and bicycle lanes should be explored. Pedestrians are also among the most vulnerable road users. In our data, pedestrians compete with drivers in the most number of road crash fatalities. In the future, pedestrians should be completely separated from vehicles, and this can be attained through elevated walkways and proper urban planning. Alcohol is the most common reported risk factor resulting to road crash. 
alcohol is significantly associated with most types of injuries based on our hospital data. Prevention is better than cure. There is a need to invest in technology and manpower to detect drunk drivers. Safety factors such as helmets, seat belts, and airbags can help prevent injuries. However, non-wearing of the safety gadgets is common and was found in our study to be associated with road crash. The initial peak in the age distribution for all databases are for children of age 5 to 8 years old. There is a need to better implement laws regarding child safety in vehicles, such as the Child Restraint Law, Children's Safety on Motorcycles Act. There is also a need to legislate laws on child safety in public utility vehicles. We also developed the Road Safety Index based on the five pillars of road safety of the World Health Organization and the United Nations Global Action considering the five pillars of action. Altogether, the components of the road safety index we have generated, as shown on the graph, are based on various databases. 1.35 million road crash data from MARAS, almost 300,000 ONACE data on road crash, and 40,000 plus patient charts from the eight tertiary hospitals in the Philippines. For the RSI individually, the road safety management, post-crash response, and safer road user indices are on an improving trend throughout the years. While safer roads and mobility index and safer vehicles index are on a worsening trend. Overall, the road safety index is on a slowly increasing trend. We believe that efforts by national and local government agencies and units have helped improve the overall road safety index. But despite the slowly improving road safety index, road crashes still continue to increase. Based on our data, road crashes increase on the average of about 4% yearly, and the number of injured brought to hospitals increases by about 20% every year. The progress that we have achieved has not occurred at a pace fast enough to compensate for the rising population and rapid motorization of our roads. There is a need to improve conditions of our roads in order to improve our road safety index, since Safer Roads Index is on a worsening trend for the past 10 years. There is also a need to decongest traffic and increase mobility on the road since road mobility index is on a worsening trend for the past 10 years. Experiences in other countries show success in road safety strategies when there is a concerted effort among sectors. In South Korea, a national strategy for school zone program led to 95% reduction in road traffic deaths among children. In Bogota, Colombia, Investment into city infrastructure for over 80 kilometers of bus rapid transport, nearly 300 kilometers of bikeways, and 60,000 square meters of pedestrian infrastructure reduce traffic deaths by 50%. In Thailand, the speed limit was decreased from 80 to 50 kilometers per hour on urban roads, which was adopted by half of its 76 provinces in 2018. In Brazil, they reduced the legal blood alcohol content from 0.06 to 0.02 grams per deciliter and decreased fatalities by 16%. Other countries have made gains in the various pillars of road safety. The Philippines has also made some improvements as shown in our data. However, to reduce road crash even by 50% will need a drastic action on our part. So far, Dr. Herbosa and I, including our esteemed speakers, have practically covered all aspects of road safety strategies to attain the safe systems approach and the vision zero. What a wonderful and insightful time with you. Sa puntong ito, gusto naming pasalamatan 
ang mga taong nasa likod ng entablado, ngunit nasa harap ng pagkalat ng mga datos at pakikipag-ugnayan sa inyong lahat. Si Paulo Concepcion, isang matematisyan at statistician at pinunong tagasiyasat ng datos. Si Sofia Ruth Mora, tagasulat at katuwang sa pagsiyasat ng mga datos. Si Jazelle Joy Reyes, tagasulat din, matyagang administrator at publication material designer. Si Bea Maria Doc, ad support na naging susi sa pagdami ng mga registrants at technical support ng Zoom. Si Janine Berame at Christian Faith Navarro ang mga gumawa ng istorya ng mga animations at video campaign materials natin kasama ang kanilang crew. Higit sa lahat, si Karina Kibinit, tagapamahala ng webinar. Napagsama mo, Karina, ang lahat ng mga top speakers sa ating webinar at naihatid sa mahigit na dalawang libong registrants ang bawat serye ng webinar. Salamat din, Sofia Francesca Lu, isang statistician at kasama sa paggawa ng konsepto ng proyektong ito sa road safety at co-host ng webinar series. Salamat din sa IMS kasama si Ronel Escares para sa Zoom platform. Sa IPAW kasama si Fedeline Jimena para sa publicity, YouTube at Facebook link. At syempre sa 40 pang mga research assistants namin na nagkalap ng datos sa walong malalaking hospital. Bukod pa sa 35 survey assistants at 10 technical staff, pangkalahatan, 90 kaming lahat sa proyektong ito. Itong programa na ito ay nagbunga sa pamumuno ni Dr. Teodoro J. Herbosa, isang trauma surgeon, isang guro at isang lingkod bayan sa road safety. Ito rin ay sa ilalim ng National Institutes of Health sa pamumuno ni Dr. Eva Maria Cuchonco de La Paz. Ang pondo, direksyon at malasakit ay galing sa Departamento ng Kalusugan, Department of Health, na siyang nagbunsad ng programang ito, Road Safety. Higit sa lahat sa inyo na nakinig sa aming webinar, maraming maraming salamat. Sinubaybayan nyo ang aming webinar series na parang TV episode. Mala nobela, ika nga. Bakit kaya? Sapagkat tayong lahat ay gumagamit ng kalsada. Lahat tayo ay road users. Ang preparasyon ng webinar series ay hindi nangyari magdamag, kundi halos dalawang taon. Naglaan ng oras at panahon ang mga manalalagsik para makipag-ugnayan sa iba't ibang ahensya ng pamahalaan at mga hospital at lumakbay sa Metro Manila, Cebu at Davao para maitaguyod ang whole of society approach at maglikom at magsiyasat ng mga datos na aming ibinahagi sa inyo. Hindi buwan kundi halos dalawang taon ang pagbuo ng proyektong ito. Dahil naniniwala kami na ang mga magagandang bagay ay nahihinang sa bawat patak ng ating pawis. Sinikap ko rin ibahagi ang mensahe at hamon sa inyo sa ating wika dahil ang ating wikang Pilipino ay may dulot na musika sa damdamin. At sa gayoy, nag-uusap tayo hindi lamang sa kaisipan, kundi sa ating puso at diwa. Bagamat kagyat, at saglit lamang tayo nagtipon sa webinar series na ito. Taos puso naming ninanais kasama si Dr. Teodora Herbosa at ng Department of Health na maisabuhay sa inyong mga puso at kamalayan ang road safety sa mga darating pang mga taon. A decade of road safety success ahead. Thank you, Dr. Lu. What an insightful look into how this road safety project came about. What a challenge as well to all of us. Road safety is everybody's priority and should be everyone's uh, priority. The project health 
burden of road crash injuries in the Philippines, assess the current road safety status in the Philippines, and Dr. Ted Herbosa and Dr. Jinky Lu presented you the key initial results of our evidence-based research. Our webinar series also provided us an avenue to raise awareness on the road safety. We introduced you to various sectors, government and non-government agencies, local and international organizations, and medical chiefs whose work and advocacy relate to road safety. By simply being a responsible road user, you can make a big difference. We encourage you to raise awareness on road safety by sharing the YouTube link to our webinar series on road safety. Please see and scan the QR code link. We also encourage you to use the following hashtags in your posts. You can view again at your own leisure time the entire video coverage of webinars 1, 2, 3, and 4, including all the road safety campaign videos. Share them to your friends, students, colleagues, and families. Surely, they will be great campaign materials. Now we are in our open forum. May I cordially request Dr. Eva Maria Cuchonco de la Paz to moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jinky. That was such um, an inspiring closing remarks for your um, uh, research project. Congratulations to you, uh, Dr. Ted Herbosa and the team. Such a community of empowered uh, people advocating for road safety. So we have about 13 minutes or so to have our Q&A. And um, Dr. Mark King has two important questions to um, two of our speakers, uh, to Dr. Sigua and Attorney Domingo. And I'd like to request Dr. King to ask your question. Uh, can you turn on your video, please, uh, sir? So you can uh, ask Dr. Sigua and Attorney Domingo. Go ahead, Dr. King. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I wrote those questions a little while ago, and I have to go back to the, uh, the website just to, uh, to check. Um, I think uh, one of the ones that I can recall I asked Dr. Sigua was to do with um, uh, motorcycles, uh, and road safety audit. In Australia, we um, have paid attention to pedestrian issues with road safety audit, which has been very important, but we don't have the same problem with motorcycles as uh, you have in the Philippines. And um, uh, you've suggested that um, you should have the, uh, the motorcycle, uh, motorcycle lanes as a form of separation, and I think that's a great idea. But I wonder about um, there are infrastructure demands in having separate lanes and um, there are also some additional issues with pedestrians having to cross motorcycle lanes. So that places a constraint, which then leads to finding ways to focus on, on motorcycle behaviours. And you mentioned making certain things illegal and uh, I was thinking that ways of enforcing that become difficult too unless you were to have some sort of automated enforcement program, and I don't know if that's been considered. And I realise that that last thing is a, a police issue rather than um, a, an infrastructure issue, uh, but you may have something to say about that. Thanks a lot for that uh, question, uh, Dr. Mark, uh, Mark King. Uh, well, it's nice to uh, meet you again. <laughs> It's been quite a while. Well, it's uh, really a challenge uh, as far as uh, the motorcycle uh, issue is concerned here in uh, our country. Um, um, for, I think, uh, well, it started really uh, way back even in the late uh, 2000 when we have a surge or increase in the uh, number of motorcycles in the country. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been looking, uh, especially uh, at this time of the pandemic, is the inclusion of the uh, uh, exclusive, uh, uh, for one, uh, bicycle lane. And uh, uh, because of the issue as well on the motorcycles, uh, we're also looking at uh, having a, a motorcycle lane uh, in um, uh, adjacent to the uh, bicycle lane because uh, 
um, if we look at the, our uh, cross section, uh, we may have to eat up uh, a lane uh, because of the bicycle lane, uh, uh, which would uh, require uh, more than a meter, maybe 1.5 meters. The remaining uh, uh, width, uh, if we take out a meet uh, a lane width, uh, would be very much appropriate for motorcycles. Uh, yes, there's issue on uh, conflicts, uh, pedestrians, uh, um, but um, we're also looking at, uh, especially at intersections, considering a specific design where we could put a, a box, no? a motorcycle box where we could uh, uh, yeah, store uh, motorcycles, uh, before, uh, uh, sorry, after the, the stop line, perhaps, or after the pedestrian crossing, uh, which is being practiced uh, in uh, many cities in Vietnam. And also, I think uh, it's, it's being implemented in Taiwan as well. So, um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, at this point, uh, most of the motorcycle lanes are still shared. Uh, we really don't have yet uh, exclusive uh, motorcycle lanes, but this is shared uh, with uh, uh, other uh, vehicles, uh, four-wheelers. But uh, there may be a need uh, for legislation on this. And uh, again, uh, uh, it could go beyond infrastructure improvement, but uh, definitely enforcement is uh, very much needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. King, I do have your question for Attorney Domingo, but if you'd like to uh, uh, say your question yourself, uh, you, you may, please. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, it was to do with um, uh, the uh, promoting the shift to public transport. And I think that I was very impressed by what's been happening in Davao. And um, I, I did wonder, though, uh, you've already got a really high use of public transport, and that is actually good because we have been trying for years in Australia to, to promote public transport use, um, uh, but it's been, it's, it's gone up a little bit lately, but over many years it's been steadily declining. And um, what I've seen in um, other countries where there's been uh, rapid motorisation and where things have been improving in the economy is that um, when people start to get cars, uh, they they tend to be people who are better off and have more influence and uh, and they uh, can really push um, for uh, things about congestion and about parking and things like that so that there's a there's a, a move away from public transport and so to actually um, uh, to try and uh, keep your levels and to improve them um, could be challenging unless uh, there is a commitment to to doing some things that discourage um, too much driving into the city by cars and things like that. And I think I mentioned in my question, I know that in uh, places like Singapore and, uh, and London, they have um, uh, tolls that uh, you have to pay if you actually uh, drive into the, uh, the central urban areas as a way of discouraging too much use to make it uh, less attractive. Um, and I just wondered if that was something that that might have to be considered in the future in the Philippines as well. Yes, uh, yes, uh, the, the, that's the way forward, but uh, probably that's uh, still a long way off from our current plans. So uh, imposing congestion charges similar to the ones that they do in Singapore, that's something that we will be considering. But in order for us to basically also get the buy-in or the cooperation of uh, private car users or owners, we have to ensure that uh, they have a very good alternative. That's why uh, the current focus really right now is to provide this very efficient and very appealing uh, kind of public transportation, which, which is the bus system. So hopefully our projections or goals are right or the goals that we want to reach would be uh, reach. Like if we provide this very good bus system, hopefully a lot of this private car users will gravitate towards using the public transport. And thereafter, maybe if and when the time comes, uh, then we have to decide whether there's still a need for us to impose these congestion charges similar to other countries. So uh, 
we, 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 we still have a long way to go. So hopefully we'll have that problem in the future. I, I do think that's a good problem for us to have. So hopefully in the, if we meet each other soon or five years from now, we, we will have a better discussion relating to this. But that's an, an, an idea that we are considering down the road. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Domingo. And thank you, Dr. King. We will now proceed with other questions. Thank you. Um, now, this question also came from the Q&A box. It's for Dr. Heroy. It's alarming to know, uh, the question is directed towards uh, Dr. Heroy. It's alarming to know how many children are victims of road crashes. In the urban setting, we see children violating road traffic rules and without supervision of adults when using the roads. What effective strategies do you think can be incorporated in um, reg uh, as regards uh, road safety for children? Go ahead, Dr. Lester. Thank you, Dr. Eva. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, mga, mga, <laughs> I think many of us grew up also with the, with the history of you know playing on the streets. It's very cultural. Um, and uh, there are there are many there are many things that that can also be done. Um, I presented. I, I wasn't able to ex to describe a bit more on the road safety parks. Uh, we have one in the Philippines in in Manila, uh, but I think uh, that's that's one way also to educate children. Um, there are also safe spaces, uh, children playgrounds, uh, where where children can and should be encouraged to play. Um, again, uh, in, in the Philippines, we don't have a very strong culture on parks, uh, safe parks, uh, although, of course, we have the plaza, you know, but as we urbanized, it became uh, more difficult. Uh, and, of course, infrastructure is there. Um, I think those are among the things we can find, uh, but that's more infrastructure. Um, the rest would be really behavior and uh, education and, uh, and parent supervision. Uh, the advantage of the pandemic situation is now everybody is supposed to be um, inside their homes or at least in restricted places. So it's one of the things we can really consider. But really, a lot of this will be uh, local government uh, efforts. You're, you're correct, Dr. Lester. I, I think it's uh, part of the whole of government approach is uh, to make more parks for the people. And uh, as more people get vaccinated now, that's something that we're going to need. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Uh, let me direct the next question to Director Haldon. Again, from our uh, audience, the question is, you showed to us the existing programs and plans in road safety for the Davao region. Do you currently have partnerships with other regions? If not, do you intend to have one? Go ahead, Dr. Haldon, Director Haldon. Um, as of the moment, uh, the in reference to Central 911 Emergency Response System, uh, is confined to Davao City local government or Davao City. Uh, however, there are LGUs that are uh, consulting with us in in terms of implementation of the system. Uh, we are providing uh, some uh, uh, assistance uh, in not only in terms of uh, technology transfer, but also in in setting up the system as a whole. Um, there are a lot of uh, inquiries, and uh, we are always uh, 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 doing uh, our best also to uh, provide them all the needed needed assistance. Thank you, thank you, Director Haldon. It's so. Uh that's so good to know that um, you are sharing your best practices to the other regions in the country. Maraming salamat po. Now, the next question is for Deputy Hannah Zaballero. Um, the question is, is the Road Emergency Group currently providing um, trainings to community volunteers, bystanders, as, for, as well as a um, oh, as first responders during accidents. Um, Deputy Hannah, please. Yes, well, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have a separate um, separate department teaching 
uh, with with regards to um, how to handle vehicular accidents, um, first aid trainings, and also um, even disaster trainings. We have the Public Safety Division. Um, yeah, they are, the ones. they are the ones who conduct the trainings. However, ito po sa road emergency group, we conduct uh, basic uh, emergencies uh, for traffic enforcers. Uh, we do provide um, um, seminars and educations to our traffic enforcers how to handle and how to respond to vehicular accidents. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Hannah. That's uh, also really good information for the people in our audience. Um, and I think, uh, is this something that's advertised in Facebook? I mean, that your training programs? I think uh, why dissemination of such initiatives is important. Um, yes, Doc. Uh, if may I add, um, if there are people or if there are any audiences that who want to um, to uh, to undergo trainings, they can write um, a request letter to our chairman, mm -hmm. and they will coordinate it to the public safety division for the trainings. Thank you it's, so much. And it's all for free, I think. Yay! Thank you, thank you. That's good to know. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Hannah. And now the question is directed towards uh, Director Villena. You explained our uh, policy making and also made recommendations. We already have existing. Um, post uh, crash response guidelines but the global safety report of WHO showed that there is poor implementation so the person in the audience would like to know what do you suggest to address this issue go ahead yes hello ma'am good afternoon good af good, uh, good morning everyone yes um as for my study i actually proposed two options uh the first option uh that i explored was to what if our emss system will be integrated with the drrm setup because as uh, observed uh, in other lgus most of them uh have a uh, their emergency response responses under uh, covered on uh, covered by the DRRM in their localities. Mm -hmm. So it is not uh, we say that it is not uh, without emergency response, but they saw it as an attachment to DRRM. But we all know that EMSS is a whole lot different um, in uh, a whole lot different with disaster from disasters per se, like uh, flooding or earthquakes, etc. So my exploration uh, brought me to the fact that I think uh, UHC gave us the necessary push to go for it and pass the EMSS Act. And uh, currently, uh, I think last April, according to the Department of Health, they made it as one of their priority bills, which is a good thing because uh, now we will be able to um, create the council to make the standards um, institutionalized across the board. I mean, across all LGUs, regardless of if, if they are first class or sixth class municipalities. At least they have so a system that they can use uh, in responding to road crashes and even other emergencies, day-to-day -day emergencies, because we do not want uh, the the condition of uh, each uh, cities or communities to become a disaster. Because in what, two of the uh, municipalities in Tabogon and another one in I think in Panay. Uh, they made road crash into one of the disasters in their area because each time there uh, there were road crashes on the roads uh, brought about by the non-use of helmet and uh, of course because of the current condition of the roads. So we want to avoid that, that scenario because we already have a lot of typhoons, a lot of um, disasters. So this day-to-day -day emergency, we have to respond to this accordingly. So my suggestion really is to advocate the push for the EMSS Act to become really a law in the near future. Thank That's you. It. Thank you, Director Villena. I think we have to have more conversations as, uh, as the, the National Institutes of Health. One of our priority programs is really setting up the uh, disaster risk uh, reduction um, and management for health center under uh, Dr. Charles Gundran. So maybe we can have uh, some uh, meetings with you 
regarding this. Thank you, Director uh, Villena. And now, um, salamat po. Um, and just for last question, and this will be for Dr. Patara and Dr. Saludares. Um, may we have the two uh, spotlighted or on spotlight. Uh, if we are able to, uh, the question is, if we are to create a national policy and post-crash response for hospital care, what would be your major recommendation? Let's start with Dr. Pataray and then Dr. Saludares. Go ahead, Dr. Pataray. Yes, thank you, Dr. Eva, for that uh, question. Uh, first, uh, we should strengthen the DOH Memorandum Order 2021 that the different specialty centers all over the region will implement the trauma services or the trauma center of care. In Visayas region, uh, this is an inter-island uh, region in which we need also to communicate with the different um, health workers in the, the certain islands. So with this, no, we, we need to coordinate with the local government units no, and at the same time, our with the spearheading of the DOH uh, 7, Region 7 for this program in order to, to strengthen the, the services and to save lives of these trauma cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pataray. Uh, Dr. Saludares, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I agree with Dr. Pataray that a strong support coming from the uh, government, the central office, the DOH, and the local government unit to improve the ser services of the uh, hospitals when it comes to uh, managing the problems uh, involving uh, post-crash events. So all the hospitals are, are already uh, preparing all the guidelines and the protocols, and we all have the manpower, the specialties, of course, to respond to these injuries. But uh, when it comes to equipment, um, there is a bit of uh, a hardship in acquiring some of these equipments. So we need support coming from the government, the central office, and the other uh, support uh, groups. So we can realize all our uh, visions in addressing this problem. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saludares. And with that, we are... Uh, uh, Thank you again. Thank you to our speakers and thank you for your uh, answers during this uh, Q and A. Um, I think our participants really learned a lot from uh, this uh, webinar series. And uh, one of our greatest takeaway from this uh, series is that. Um, so I, we're ending the Q and A now and uh, proceeding to the closing ceremonies. But for me, one of the my greatest takeaway from this webinar series is that road safety is really a health issue and it is everyone's responsibility. We have to come together to collaborate and co coordinate our response to keep our roads safe um, and our the Filipinos safe from road crash injuries. So with that, I'm turning over it back to Dr. Jinkilu. Again, congratulations to you and Dr. Ted Herbosa, Dr. Sofia, uh, Lou for and your, your whole team uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, and excellent webinar series. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eva and our esteemed speakers. Our reactor is a health promotion practitioner from the Department of Health. Mr. Armand D.M. Argeles has a background in development communication and social science. His work involves promoting and co-creating healthy communities through research, policy and collaboration on key social health determinants, including active transport, safety and violence, and injury prevention. Please welcome Mr. Armon D.M. Orgueles. Okay, uh, good morning bo, to everyone. Uh, good morning to the participants today. No? And before anything, I'd like to congratulate uh, all our presenters for very insightful presentations a while ago. And of course, a big congratulations to uh, the team behind 
uh, this uh, series of workshops no, for amazing work. And uh, thank you for inviting again the, the Health Promotion Bureau uh, to do a very quick reaction to the discussion. So the DOH, uh, through the Health Promotion Bureau, uh, we remain committed to uh, promoting road safety, inclusive reuse of roads uh, in the country, and in particular for our vulnerable road users, no? so including our Filipino commuters, of course, our pedestrians, and even our impoverished uh, public transport workers. No? Road safety and violence and injury prevention uh, is one of our priority areas, actually, for health promotion. So while we commend po, uh, the efficient trauma and uh, road crash services in hospital settings, as very comprehensively discussed a while ago by uh, Dr. Saludaris in ISTAV and Dr. Pataray in PSMMC, uh, the importance of operating post-crash services, I believe, was also highlighted in the presentation of Deputy Head Hana from MDA. So apart po from uh, these uh, efficient, service, efficient services, the DOH especially with the implementation of the Universal Healthcare Act, uh, we also now provide a significant gravity as well to efforts that are on health promotion. So how do we do health promotion? As mentioned uh, with UHC po, uh, the DOH continues to shift its efforts from the conventional curative view of health uh, we now provide a uh, premium to health promotion as well. No? So we're viewing it um, more holistically. So for communities to be truly a healthy community, apart from, of course, having a responsive local health system, we look at uh, healthy people in healthy places. Now, when we say healthy people, this is more the behavioral uh, aspect where we tackle knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes uh, we roll out campaigns that penetrate strategic interpersonal relationships. And uh, we have campaigns that in general intend to influence the norms and activities in the community. You know, on the flip side, healthy places, this is more the structural with laws and policies and their enforcement you know, with media as well as an institution and other state apparatuses. So more specifically, we said that health is no longer just uh, about the prevention or control and treatment of disease. It now involves uh, developing healthy public policies now guided by the action areas of the Ottawa Charter. Uh, we focus health promotion on uh, public policies, on creating health supportive environments, strengthening community action. No? And to re-echo siguro po yung uh, response ni Dr. Heroy a while ago to a question, no? uh, this includes... Uh, providing or ensuring that there is protected, protected and safe space for children. So that includes promotion of active transport uh, and uh, open and green spaces for everyone, not just for children actually, but uh, for uh, the general population to encourage and to promote uh, physical activity as well. No? We also have developing personal skills so they can practice healthy behaviors and of course reorienting health services towards uh, health promotion. For all of these strategies, we need research and evidence uh, inputs. So right now, in DOH, we have some efforts to generate research and evidence in inputs to support health promotion. So we're rolling out health literacy assessments with the assistance of our regional offices. We're also institu institutionalizing uh, health policy and systems research and uh, participatory action research. You know, results from this, from this uh, research activities or research efforts, uh, we are hoping that they would inform our health literacy interventions, our social and behavioral change communication campaigns, and other health promotion interventions and activities in the community. Po, no? All of this, they are still being institutionalized, uh, but they are being done po at the moment. And uh, siguro within the, re within the realm of uh, road safety you know, or on discussions about transport and mobility, these efforts would focus more on the vulnerable road users, as uh, mentioned a while ago, uh, the cyclists and pedestrians and uh, impoverished public transport workers. Uh, yung questions on this would include, how do we generate and sustain demand for active transport? Or let's increase their awareness and knowledge and attitudes towards this particular behavior, you know? Uh, and, but admittedly, all of these are still at the behavioral level. And as we've said a while ago, uh, health promotion should work, should operate at both at the behavioral level and the structural level. No? Perhaps to end po, uh, we'll leave you lang with a note from, 
from Professor Benjamin Barr. He's a public health professor in Liverpool University. He said, too much public health research is focused on changing the behavior of the powerless rather than uh, the behavior of the powerful. No? On some level, I would say na it resonates. Po, no? uh, we need to focus more on the role of the powerful, the corporate or the political actors or the actions of those with lots of political and symbolic capital. Po, no? We need to complement our health literacy efforts, our KAP campaigns, our other behavioral research inputs with evidence on the commercial determinants of health, on the political, uh, social, and structural dimensions of how we can improve public health research, and in this case, for the benefit of road safety, violence, and injury prevention. No? Director uh, Pamela Gervasio comprehensively discussed earlier the roles and laws that apply to motorists. Uh, by comparison, they are more in power. Than, in, than our vulnerable road users. No? So that's one. On a higher level, how we engage, how we lobby, advocate, and negotiate, and how we enter effectively, uh, enter into meaningful collaboration with our actual decision makers, both at the level of the national and our local governments, should also be subject of our public health research. No? And I'm direct. Uh, Dr. Heroy presented also a while ago some key recommendations on engaging and building the capacity of our regional network of actors on violence and injury prevention. No? He said uh, that there's a need for a lot of political will for uh, the adoption and implementation and enforcement of uh, these policies and the widespread interagency collaboration to make the efforts effective. Uh, there's also a need for adequate and inclusive infrastructure to mobilize budget and resources uh, for our efforts. No? Dr. Jinkulu also presented some uh, good practices from other countries. No? And these things happen at the level of the structure, not the structural level, uh, the level of those in power. So the DOH, uh, while we are trying to work on this, we have several partners with LGS right now. They are trying out our health promotion interventions, but we also call on actors. So let's complement each other's research and evidence portfolios. Let's capacitate each other on areas that we need improvement on. Uh, let's continue to build a network of public health uh, researchers uh, that focus on the priority areas of health promotion, not just in Manila or in key metropolitan areas in the country, no, but in regional locations as well. So we can mobilize local and community-based organizations with demonstrated research capacity, and of course our SUCs, no, our state universities and the regions, they have the potential to work with us to provide uh, more evidence-based uh, uh, backing to our policies that we are lobbying at the national level. So we can be partners uh, for, for this now, for more evidence-based health promotion interventions on our priority areas, including, of course, our topic for today, which is uh, road safety, violence, and injury prevention. So that's it for uh, our reaction. Po, no? Thanks again for inviting the Health Promotion Bureau and congratulations to all the speakers and to the amazing team behind this uh, uh, work. Po. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arguelles, for that wonderful reaction to our webinar series. Now, we will proceed to show you again another video campaign on road safety. Araw-araw, nakikipagsapalaran. Araw-araw, lumalaban. Bawat isa, may tunguhin. Kanya-kanyang diskarte kung paano makakarating. Bawat hakbang, tayo ay may katuwang. Sa ating paglalakbay, merong aalalay. Huwag kalimutang mag-seatbelt dahil ito ay maaaring magsalba ng buhay. Ang helmet, elbow pad at knee pad ang kalasag mo at sasala sa'yo, mahulog ka man o mabigo. Bago lumusong, siguraduhin mahigpit at sakto. Siyempre, gusto rin natin na may aalalay sa mga mahal natin sa buhay. Car seats para kay baby at pet carrier naman para kay kitty o doggy. Isa kang sandigan. Maaasahan at kahit ikaw, sa panahon ng pangangailangan, 
ay meron ding makakapitan. Hindi ka nag-iisa. Habang ikaw ay naglalakbay, tandaan na sayo ay may handang umalalay. Ingat! point, may we have a group photo with all the speakers first, followed by the panelists with the organizers. May I request the, all the speakers and opening ceremony guests to turn on their cameras? One, two, three. May I request all the panelists and organizers to turn their cameras on? One, two, three. Thank you, everyone. We thank everyone again for taking part in our fourth and last webinar on road safety, a decade of success ahead for the evaluation form. Please log in at the link provided on the screen. This is a requirement for the certificate of attendance and will only be available until 11.59 p.m. today. May we call on Dr. Ted Herbosa to synthesize this session and provide his closing remarks. Reducing road traffic deaths requires paying more attention to the needs of everyone using our roads, drivers, commuters, and pedestrians. Promoting road safety should be a collective responsibility of everyone. With the high number of road accidents inside and outside our country, we must be committed to lowering road crashes each year. What have we learned so far? What have we emphasized? First is building road safety management capacity. This includes encouraging multi-sectoral partnerships to develop and lead the delivery of national road safety strategies, plans, and targets for the Philippines. Next is improving the safety of road infrastructure by raising standards and quality of road networks that will benefit all road users, especially the most vulnerable. Regular assessments of road systems should be made to inform planning, design, construction, and operation of the roads we use every day. Third is further developing the safety of vehicles. Innovations around vehicle safety technology have been rapidly improving throughout the years. Fourth is enhancing the behavior of road users, a very crucial part. We should continue enforcing traffic laws and standards together with constant public awareness, strategies to reduce drunk driving, overspeeding, and other harmful road practices. The last is improving post-crash response. We aim to improve the ability of our systems in providing efficient and effective first response at the site of incident, increasing responsiveness to post-crash emergencies, and improving the ability of health facilities to provide appropriate trauma care and long-term rehabilitation for crash victims. In the end, we must be able to reconcile mobility and road safety together. Paano mapabilis ang galaw ng mga tao at kasabay nito ay maitaguyod ang kaligtasan sa daan? This means that we have a great task ahead of making mobility as safe, as environmentally friendly, and as socially fair as possible. Mobility as safe as possible means preventing road crashes through the five pillars. Environmentally friendly as possible means reducing motorization of roads, improving mass transport infrastructures such as MRTs and LRTs, and improving vehicle technology. Socially fair as possible means protecting the weaker and vulnerable road users, the pedestrians, and the riders of two-wheelers having dedicated motorcycle and bicycle lanes and dedicated pedestrian footpaths and crossings. Remember, we all have rights to our roads, 
but we want to remind all of you to be courteous and respectful. Create roads, cities, and communities that are safe and accessible. We, the research team, sincerely hope that we have not only steered you towards road safety behaviors, but towards a road safety culture. So virtual, yet so real, so far, yet so near, so short of a webinar series, yet so deep. I believe in our connectedness in road safety. What a journey with all of you, four webinars in the series. We end this webinar by reminding everyone, road safety is everyone's responsibility, should be everybody's priority. Mabuhay ang Pilipino, maraming salamat po. Thank you to all of you. We hope our webinar series have inspired you all. Road safety is everyone's responsibility and should be everybody's priority. Stay alert and be safe on the road. Mabuhay! Mabuhay. Recording stopped.